Hello there. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special celebration live stream. We've reached 5,000 subscribers on the channel, and I announced that when we reach that milestone, I'll be reading this wonderful classic, Boy by Roald Dahl. And so, yeah, we've reached that. And so thanks to all of you guys for not only subscribing, but for coming back week on week and joining in the live streams. Uh, yeah, it, it makes it all worthwhile that you guys enjoy it. And um, yeah, hello there, Donna, Dark Fur, Lux Illuminati. I'm glad you could make a live stream. Uh, Soul Sister, welcome. Karen, thank you very much. You're very kind. And so, yeah, I'll just share a few um, words about the book while we give everyone a chance to come in. I think this was the the most people waiting to begin. So thanks for that. And it's lovely to see you all. Thanks for coming and, and sharing in the celebrations with us. Like I say, you guys, um, yeah, make the channel what it is. So thanks very much. And um, from Northern Ireland. Hello there, Karen. So let me read you a few words about this brilliant book uh, for a number of reasons. <clears throat> it says here, as a boy, all sorts of unusual things happened to Roald Dahl. There was the time he had, he and four school friends got their revenge on beastly Mrs. Pratchett in her sweet shop. There are stories of holidays in fishing boats, African adventures and the days of toasting chocolates for Cadbury's. You'll hear tales of horrible school bullies and the motor car accident when Roald's nose was nearly sliced clean off. Roald Dahl vividly shares his memories. Some are funny, some are painful, some are unpleasant. All are true. Throughout his young days at school and just afterwards, a number of things happened to Roald Dahl which made such a tremendous impression he never forgot them. Boy is the remarkable story of Roald Dahl's childhood. And then from another source, Boy Tales of Childhood, published in 1984, is an autobiography written by British writer Roald Dahl. The book describes his life from early childhood until leave, leaving school, focusing on living conditions in Britain in the 1920s and 30s, the public school system at the time, and how his childhood experience led him to writing children's books as a career. It, include, it concludes with his first job working for Royal Dutch Shell, and his life continues in the book Going Solo, which I hope to read next weekend. I don't see why not. It seems like the ideal time to read Going Solo next Sunday. And we've got a lot of comments. It's fantastic. Hello, Jill. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Lux Illuminati, thank you. Uh, Sammy Smith, I, I missed that. Hannah O'Sullivan, thank you and thank you. Yep, it's my birthday tomorrow as well. So double celebrations, as you all know. Sammy Smith, lovely to see you. And I appreciate that, Hannah. Green Grapes, hello, look at this. What a fantastic start before we've even started. It's so lovely to have you all here right from the beginning and to go on this wonderful journey. So yeah, we're going to learn about Royal Dahl's life his experiences in childhood, why he has this um, sort of uh, opinion and attitude towards grown-ups. You'll find out all about that, why he feels that way about grown-ups because of the grown-ups he experienced in his um, early years. And also we get a look back into England in the 1920s and 30s and how life in... Um, yeah, in boarding school would have been in, in those times. Um, Green Grapes, Becky Miller, uh, thank you very much. And Google, Google, I'm glad you made it too. So this is, is so great. Thank you uh, for sharing this double celebration with me. If you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button and like the video. And maybe as a birthday present, share the show on your social medias. Maybe a bit cheeky of me to ask that, but why not? So, everyone who needs to be here, 
Um, yeah, well, it's very sad that uh, we've had a few um, copyright issues over at Lewis Kirk, but here we go. Obviously, it won't be as, as clean as the um, audio ebook version on the Lewis Kirk channel, but it'll be close to it. So let's go. Boy by Roald Dahl. And here's his sort of semi-introduction. He says, An autobiography is a book a person writes about his own life and, it and it's usually full of all sorts of boring details. This is not an autobiography. I would never write a history of myself. On the other hand, throughout my young days at school and just afterwards, a number of things happened to me that I have never forgotten. None of these things is important, but each of them made such a tremendous impression on me that I have never been able to get them out of my mind. Each of them, even after a lapse of fifty and sometimes sixty years, has remained seared on my memory. I didn't have to search for any of them. All I had to do was skim them off the top of my consciousness and write them down. Some are funny, some are painful, some are unpleasant. I suppose that is why I have always remembered them so vividly. All are true. <laughs> Thanks, Dark Fur. And you're very welcome. And Onel, Onel Silvo. Hello there. Welcome, everyone. Perfect timing. Starting point. Papa and Mama. My father, Harold Dahl, was a Norwegian who came from a small town near Oslo called Sarpsborg. His own father, my grandfather, was a fairly prosperous merchant who owned a store in Sarpsborg and traded in just about everything from cheese to chicken wire. I'm writing these words in 1984, but this grandfather of mine was born, believe it or not, in 1820, shortly after Wellington had defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. If my grandfather had been alive today, he would have been 164 years old. My father would have been 121. Both my father and my grandfather were late starters, so far as children were concerned. When my father was 14, which is still more than 100 years ago, he was up on the roof of the family house, replacing some loose tiles when he slipped and fell. He broke his left arm below the elbow. Somebody ran to fetch the doctor, and half an hour later, this gentleman made a majestic and drunken arrival in his horse-drawn buggy. He was so drunk that he mistook the fractured elbow for a dislocated elbow. We'll soon put this back into place, he cried out, and two men were called off the street to help with the pulling. They were instructed to hold my father by the waist, while the doctor grabbed him by the wrist of the broken arm and shouted, Pull, men, pull! Pull as hard as you can! The pain must have been excruciating. The victim screamed and his mother, who was watching the performance in horror, shouted, Stop! But by then the pullers had done so much damage that a splinter of bone was sticking out through the skin of the forearm. <laughs> Hello, a lumpy horse. Sup, lumpy. <laughs> This was in 1877, and orthopaedic surgery was not what it is today, so they simply amputated the arm at the elbow, and for the rest of his life my father had to manage with one arm. Fortunately, it was the left arm that he lost, and gradually over the years he taught himself to do more or less anything he wanted with just the four fingers and thumb of his right hand. He could tie a shoelace as quickly as you or me, and for cutting up the food on his plate, he sharpened the bottom edge of the fork so that it served as both knife and fork all in one. He kept his ingenious instrument in a slim leather case and carried it in his pocket wherever he went. The loss of an arm, he used to say, caused him only one serious inconvenience. He found it impossible to cut the top of a boiled egg. My father was a year or so older than his brother Oscar, but they were exceptionally close, and soon after they left school they went for a long walk together to plan their future. They decided that a small town like Sarpsborg, in a small country like Norway, was no place in which to make a fortune, 
So what they must do, they agreed, was go away to one of the big countries, either to England or to France, where opportunities to make good would be boundless. Their own father, an amiable giant, nearly seven foot tall, lacked the drive and ambition of his sons, and he refused to support this tomfool idea. When he forbade them to go, they ran away from home, and somehow or other they, the two of them managed to work their way to France on a cargo ship. Hello there, Claire Bear. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> that sounds great, mince pie. I've got a coffee, no mince pie, sadly, but... Thanks, everyone, for the... Well wishes and congratulations. It's all it's all down to you, really, so thanks to you guys. From Calais, they went to Paris, and in Paris they agreed to separate because each of them wished to be independent of the other. Uncle Oscar, for some reason, headed west for La Rochelle on the Atlantic coast, while my father remained in Paris for the time being. Me, me, you, you, hello there, welcome. Just in time, we've just started. The story of how these two brothers each started a totally separate business in different countries and how each of them made a fortune is interesting. But there is no time to tell it here except in the briefest manner. Take my uncle Oscar first. La Rochelle was then and still is a fishing port. By the time he was 40, he had become the wealthiest man in town. He owned a fleet of trawlers called Pechures de l'Antique and a large canning factory to, to can the sardines his trawlers brought in. He acquired a wife from a good family, and a magnificent town house, as well as a large chateau in the country. He became a collector of Louis XV furniture, good pictures and rare books, and all these beautiful things together with, with the two proprietors, or sorry, with the two properties, are still in the family. I have not seen the chateau in the country, but I was in La Rochelle House a couple of years ago, and it really is something. The furniture alone should be in a museum. <clears throat> Thank you, Lumpy Horse, and Beth, welcome. And I think you're right there, Hannah. Uh, this is the biggest dream, so thanks all for coming and sharing this with me. While Uncle Oscar was bustling around in La Rochelle, his one-armed brother, Harold, my own father, was not sitting on his rump doing nothing. He had met in Paris another young Norwegian called Adnesen, and the, and the two of them now decided to form a partnership and become shipbrokers. A shipbroker is a person who supplies a ship with everything it needs when it comes into port, fuel and food, ropes and paint, soap and towels, hammers and nails, and thousands of other tiddly little items. A shipbroker is a kind of enormous shopkeeper for ships, and by far the most important item he supplies to them is the fuel on which the ship's engines run. In those days, fuel meant only one thing. It meant coal. There were no oil-burning motor ships on the high seas at that time. All ships were steamships, and these old steamers would take on hundreds and often thousands of tons of coal in one go. To the shipbrokers, coal was black gold. My father and his newfound friend, Mr. Adnison, understood this very well. It made sense, they told each other, to set up their shipbroking business in one of the great coaling ports of Europe. Which was it to be? The answer was simple. The greatest coaling port in the world at that time was Cardiff in South Wales. So off to Cardiff they went, these two ambitious young men carrying with them little or no luggage. But my father had something more delightful than luggage. He had a wife, a young French girl called Marie, whom he had recently married in Paris. In Cardiff, the shipbroking firm of Adnison and Dahl was set up and a single room in Butte Street was rented as an office. From then on, we have what sounds like one of those exaggerated fairy stories of success, but in reality it was the result of tremendous hard and brainy work by these two friends. Very soon, Adnison and Dahl had more business than the partners could handle alone. Larger office space was acquired and more staff were engaged. The real money then began rolling in. Within a few years, my father was able to buy a fine house in the village of Landaff, 
just outside Cardiff, and there his wife Marie bore him two children, a girl and a boy, but tragically she died after giving birth to the second child. When the shock and sorrow of her death had begun to subside a little, my father suddenly realised that his two small children ought at the very least to have a stepmother to care for them. What is more, he felt terribly lonely. It was quite obvious that he must try to find himself another wife. But this was easier said than done for a Norwegian living in South Wales who didn't know very many people. So he decided to take a holiday and travel back to his own country, Norway, and who knows, he might, if he was lucky, find himself a lovely new bride in his own country. Hello there, Sonia. Welcome. Over in Norway during the summer of 1911, while taking a trip in a small coastal steamer in the Olsfjord, he met a young lady called Sophie Magdalene Hesselberg. Being a fellow who knew a good thing when he saw one, he proposed to her within a week and married her soon after that. Harold Dahl took his Norwegian wife on a honeymoon in Paris and after that back to the house in Landaff. The two of them were deeply in love and blissfully happy and during the next six years she bore him four children, a girl, another girl, a boy, me and a third girl. There were now six children in the family, two at my father's first, or sorry, two by my father's first wife, and four by his second. A larger and grander house was needed, and the money was there to buy it. So, in 1918, when I was two, we all moved into an imposing country mansion beside the village of Radu, about eight miles west of Cardiff. I remember it as a mighty house with turrets and, and on its roof and with majestic lawns and terraces all round it. There were many acres of farm and woodland and a number of cottages for the staff. Very soon the meadows were full of milking cows and the styes were full of pigs and the chicken run was full of chickens. There were several massive shire horses for pulling the ploughs and the hay wagons, and there was a ploughman and a cowman and a couple of gardeners and all manner of servants in the house itself. Like his brother Oscar in La Rochelle, Harold Dahl had made it in no uncertain manner. But what interests me most of all about these two brothers, Harold and Oscar, is this. Although they came from a simple, unsophisticated, small-town family, both of them, quite independently of one another, developed a powerful interest in beautiful things. As soon as they could afford it, they began to fill their houses with lovely paintings and fine furniture. In addition to that, my father became an expert gardener, and above all, a collector of alpine plants. My mother used to tell me how the two of them would go on expeditions up into the mountains of Norway, and how he would frighten her to death by climbing one-handed up steep cliff faces to reach small alpine plants growing high up on some rocky ledge. He was also an accomplished woodcarver, and most of the mirror frames in the house were his own work. So indeed was the entire mantelpiece around the fireplace in the living room, a splendid design of fruit and foliage and intertwining branches carved in oak. He was a tremendous dairy writer, oh sorry, diary writer. <clears throat> Not a dairy writer. He was a tremendous diary writer. I still have one of his many notebooks from the Great War of 1914 to 1918. Every single day during those five war years, he would write several pages of comment and observation about the events of the time. He wrote with a pen, and although Norwegian was his mother tongue, he always wrote his diaries in perfect English. He harboured a curious theory about how to develop a sense of beauty in the minds of his children. Every time my mother became pregnant, he would wait until the last three months of her pregnancy, and then he would announce to her that the glorious walks must begin. These glorious walks consisted of him taking her to places of great beauty in the countryside and walking with her for about an hour each day so that she could absorb the splendour of the surroundings. His theory was that if the eye of a pregnant woman was constantly observing the beauty of nature, this beauty would somehow become transmitted to the mind of the unborn baby within her womb and that baby would grow up to be a lover of beautiful things. This was the treatment that all of his children received before they were born. 
Kindergarten, 1922 to 1923, aged six to seven. <laughs> In 1920, when I was still only three, my mother's eldest child, my own sister, Astri, died from appendicitis. She was seven years old when she died, which was also the age of my own eldest daughter, Olivia when she died from measles, 42 years later. Yeah, no, Hannah is great, isn't it? Thanks everyone for being here and joining the celebrations. I couldn't have asked for anything more. <clears throat> an, an early birthday present for sure, so thanks. <clears throat> Astri was far and away my father's favourite. He adored her beyond measure, and her sudden death left him literary, literally speechless for days afterwards. He was so overwhelmed with grief that when he himself went down with pneumonia a month or so afterwards, he did not much care whether he lived or died. If they had had penicillin in those days, neither appendicitis nor pneumonia would have been so much of a threat. But with no penicillin or any other magical antibiotic cures, pneumonia in particular was a very dangerous illness indeed. The pneumonia patient, on about the fourth or fifth day, would invariably reach what was known as the crisis. The temperature soared and the pulse became rapid. The patient had to fight to survive. My father refused to fight. He was thinking, I am quite sure, of his beloved daughter, and he was wanting to join her in heaven. So he died. He was 57 years old. Uh, Hannah, maybe, um, maybe a little bit later than um, eight, but I will be, yes. Thanks, Becky, for sharing, and Dark Fur for sharing, and Mimi UU for sharing. Thanks, everyone. So, yes, I'll be back tomorrow night, but a little bit later when, once the children are in bed. Hannah. My mother had now lost a daughter and a husband all in the space of a few weeks. Heaven knows what it must have felt like to be hit with a double catastrophe like this. Here she was, a young Norwegian in a foreign land, suddenly having to face all alone the very gravest problems and responsibilities. She had five children to look after, three of her own and two by her husband's first wife, and to make matters worse, she herself was expecting another baby in two months' time. A less courageous woman would almost certainly have sold the house and packed her bags and headed straight back to Norway with the children. Over there, in her own country, she had her mother and father willing and waiting to help her, as well as, two, as, well as her two unmarried sisters, but she refused to take the easy way out. Her husband had always stated, most emphatically, that he wished all his children to be educated in English schools. They were the best in the world, he used to say, Better by far than, Nor than the Norwegian ones, better even than the Welsh ones, despite the fact that he lived in Wales and had his business there. He maintained that there was some kind of magic about English schooling and that the education it provided had caused the inhabitants of a small island to become a great nation and a great empire and to produce the world's greatest literature. No child of mine, he kept saying, is going to school anywhere else but in England. My mother was determined to carry out the wishes of her dead husband. To accomplish this, she would have to move house from Wales to England, but she wasn't ready for that yet. She must stay here in Wales for a while longer, where she knew people who could help and advise her, especially her husband's great friend and partner, Mr. Adnison. But even if she wasn't leaving Wales quite yet, it was essential that she move to a smaller and more manageable house. She had enough children to look after without having to bother about a farm as well. So, as soon as her fifth child, another daughter, was born, she sold the big house and moved to a smaller one a few miles away in Landaff. It was called Cumberland Lodge, and it was nothing more than a pleasant medium-sized suburban villa. So it was in Landaff two years later, when I was six years old, that I went to my first school. Thank you, Sonia, and hello there, DCMSR. 
Nice name there. Hello, don't worry. Good timing. <clears throat> the school was a kindergarten run by two sisters, Mrs Caulfield and Miss Tucker and it was called Elm Tree House. It is astonishing how little one remembers about one's life before the age of seven or eight. I can tell you all sorts of things that happened to me from eight onwards, but only very few before that. I went for a whole year to Elm Tree House, but I cannot even remember what my classroom looked like, nor can I picture the faces of Mrs Caulfield or Miss Tucker, although I am sure they were sweet and smiling. I do have a blurred memory of sitting on the stairs and trying over and over again to tie one of my shoelaces, but that is all that comes back to me at this distance of the school itself. On the other hand, I can remember very clearly the journeys I made to and from the school because they were so tremendously exciting. Great excitement is probably the only thing that really interests a six-year-old boy and it sticks in his mind. In my case, the excitement centred around my new tricycle, I rode to school on it every day with my eldest sister riding on hers. No grown-ups came with us and I can remember oh so vividly how the two of us used to go racing at enormous tricycle speeds down the middle of the road and then, most glorious of all, when we came to a corner, we would lean to one side and take it on two wheels. All this, you must realise, was in the good old days when the sight of a motor car on the street was an event and it was quite safe for tiny children to go tricycling, whooping their way to school in the centre of the highway. So much then for my memories of kindergarten 62 years ago. It's not much, but it's all there is left. <clears throat> There's young, young Dahl tricycling to school. <clears throat> the next part, Landaff Cathedral School. 1923 to 1925, aged 7 to 9. The Bicycle and the Sweet Shop When I was seven, my mother decided I should leave kindergarten and go to a proper boys' school. By good fortune, there existed a well-known preparatory school for boys about a mile from our house. It was called Landaff Cathedral School, and it stood right under the shadow of Landaff Cathedral. Like the cathedral, the school is still there, and still flourishing. But here again I can remember very little about the two years I attended Landaff Cathedral School, between the age of seven and nine. Only two moments remain clearly in my mind. The first lasted not more than five seconds, but I will never forget it. It was my first term, and I was walking home alone across the village green after school, when suddenly one of the senior twelve-year-old boys came riding full speed down the road on his bicycle about twenty yards away from me. The road was on a hill, and the boy was going down the slope, and as he flashed by, he started backpedalling very quickly so that the freewheeling mechanism of his bike made a loud whirring sound. At the same time, he took his hands off the handlebars and folded them casually across his chest. I stopped dead and stared after him. How wonderful he was! How swift and brave and graceful in his long trousers with bicycle clips around them and his scarlet school cap at a jaunty angle on his head. One day, I told myself, one glorious day I will have a bike like that and I will wear long trousers with bicycle clips and my school cap will sit jaunty on my head and I will go whizzing down the hill, pedalling backwards with no hands on the handlebars. I promise you that if somebody had caught me by the shoulder at that moment and said to me, what is your greatest wish in life, little boy? What is your absolute ambition? To be a doctor, a fired musician, a painter, a writer, or the Lord Chancellor? I would have answered without hesitation that my only ambition, my hope, my longing was to have a bike like that and to go whizzing down the hill with no hands on the handlebars. It would be fabulous. It made me tremble just to think about it. My second and only other memory of Landath Cathedral School is extremely bizarre. It happened a little over a year later, when I was just nine. By then I had made some friends, and when I walked to school in the mornings, I would start out alone, but would pick up four other boys of my own age along the way. After school was over, the same four boys and I would set out together across the village green, and through the village itself, heading for home. 
On the way to school and on the way back, we always passed the sweet shop. No, we didn't. We never passed it. We always stopped. We lingered outside its rather small window, gazing in at the big glass jars full of bullseyes and old-fashioned humbugs and strawberry bonbons and glacier mints and acid drops and pear drops and lemon drops and all the rest of them. Each of us received sixpence a week for pocket money, and whenever there was any money in our pockets, we would all troop in together and buy a pennyworth of this or that. My own favourites were sherbet suckers and licorice bootlaces. One of the other boys, whose name was Thwaites, told me I should never eat licorice bootlaces. Thwaites' father, who was a doctor, had said that they were made from from rat's blood. (laughs) The father had given his young son a lecture about licorice bootlaces when he had caught him eating one in bed. Every rat catcher in the country, the father had said, takes his rats to the licorice bootlace factory and the manager pays tuppence for each rat. Many a rat catcher has become a millionaire by selling his dead rats to the factory. But how do they turn the rats into licorice? The young Thwaites had asked his father. They wait until they've got 10,000 rats, the father had answered. Then they dump them all into a huge shiny steel cauldron and boil them up for several hours. Two men stir the bubbling cauldron with long poles, and in the end they have a thick, steaming rat stew. After that, a cruncher is lowered into the cauldron to crunch the bones, and what's left is a pulpy substance called rat mash. Yes, but how do they turn that into licorice bootlaces, Daddy? The young Thwaites had asked, and this question, according to Thwaites, has called his father to pause and think for a few moments before he answered it. At last, he had said, The two men who were doing the stirring with the long poles now put on their Wellington boots and climb into the cauldron and shovel the hot rat mash out onto a concrete floor. Then they run a steamroller over it several times to flatten it out. What is left looks rather like a gigantic black pancake, and all they have to do after that is to wait for it to cool and to harden so they can cut it into strips to make the bootlaces. Don't ever eat them, the father had said. If you do, you'll get ratitis. What is ratitis, Daddy? Young Thwaites had asked. All the rats and the rat catchers, sorry, all the rats and the rat catchers catch are poisoned with rat poison, the father had said. It's the rat poison that gives you ratitis. Yes, but what happens to you when you get when you catch it? Young Thwaites had asked. Your teeth become very sharp and pointed, the father had answered. And a short, stumpy tail grows out of your back, just above your bottom. There is no cure for ratitis. I ought to know. I'm a doctor. <laughs> I don't think so, Dark Fur. And also, it's, it's funny when he's writing, like... This bit, obviously, about ratitis and the licorice, it um, it would have informed uh, the witches, right? Because in the witches, the witches turn the boys into rats, don't they? So, um, yeah, it's interesting to, to see as we go through his experiences, how they inform his writing and his stories later on. <clears throat> We all enjoyed Thwaites' story and we made him tell it to us many times on our walks to and from school, but it didn't stop any of us except Thwaites from buying licorice bootlaces. At two for a penny, they were the best value in the shop. A bootlace, in case you haven't had the pleasure of handling one, is not round. It's like a flat black tape about half an inch wide. You buy it rolled up in a coil, and in those days it used to be so long that when you unrolled it and held it at an, at an arm's length above your head, the other end touched the ground. Sherbet suckers were also two a penny. Each sucker consisted of a yellow cardboard tube filled with sherbet powder, and there was a hollow licorice straw inside sticking out of it. Rat's blood again, young Thwaites would warn us, pointing at the licorice straw. You sucked the sherbet up through the straw, and when it was finished, you ate the licorice. <clears throat> they, were de- they were delicious, those sherbet suckers. The sherbet fizzed in your mouth, and if you knew how to do it, you could make white froth come out of your nostrils and pretend you were throwing a fit. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> Gobstoppers costing a penny each were enormous, hard, round balls the size of small tomatoes. One gobstopper would provide about an hour's worth of non-stop sucking, and if you took it out of your mouth and inspected it every five minutes or so, you would find it had changed colour. There was something fascinating about the way it went from pink to blue to green to yellow. We used to wonder how in the world the gobstopper factory managed to achieve this magic. How does it happen, we would ask each other. How can they make it keep changing colour? It's your spit that does it, young Thwaites proclaimed. As the son of a doctor, he considered himself to be an authority on all things that had to do with the body. He could tell us about scabs and when they were ready to be picked off. He knew why a black eye was blue and why blood was red. It's your spit that makes a gobstopper change colour, he kept insisting. When we asked him to elaborate on this theory, he answered, You wouldn't understand it if I did tell you. Pear drops were exciting because they had a dangerous taste. They smelled of nail varnish and they froze the back of your throat. All of us were warned against eating them, and the result was that we ate them more than ever. Then there was a hard brown lodging, lozenge called tonsil tickler. The tonsil tickler tasted and smelled very strongly of chloroform. We had not the slightest doubt that these things were saturated in the dreaded anaesthetic which, as Thwaites had many times pointed out to us, could put you to sleep for hours at a stretch. If my father had to saw off somebody's leg, he said, he pours chloroform onto a pad and the person sniffs it and goes to sleep and my father saws his leg off without him even feeling it. But why do they put it into sweets and sell them to us? We asked him. You might think a question like this would have baffled Thwaites, but Thwaites was never baffled. My father says tonsil ticklers were invented for dangerous prisoners in jail, he said. They give them one with each meal and the chloroform makes them sleepy and stops them rioting. <laughs> yes, we said, but why sell them to children? It's a plot, Thwaites said, a grown-up plot to keep us quiet. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what I was just going to say, Dark Fur. Charlie in the Chocolate Factory with the funny names. Everyone's got their uh, sherbet stories <laughs> and rat stories. So, yes, I can remember um, licorice I would have would have had a sweet in the middle. And you unroll it and then there's a, I don't know what the sweet was called, but I have memories of, uh, I must have had ratitis when I was younger as well. <clears throat> the sweet shop in Landaff in the year 1923 was the very centre of our lives. To us it was what a bar is to a drunk or a church is to a bishop. Without it there would have been little to live for. But it had one terrible drawback, this sweet shop. The woman who owned it was a horror. We hated her, and we had good reason for doing so. Her name was Mrs. Pratchett. She was a small, skinny old hag with a moustache on her upper lip, and a mouth as sour as a green gooseberry. She never smiled. She never welcomed us when we went in, and the only time she spoke were when she said things like, I'm watching you so you keep your thieving fingers off them chocolates. Or, I don't want you in here to just look around. Either you forks out or you gets out. And uh, in that face, I'm seeing um, one of the aunties from James and the Giant Peach. Um, Aunt Spiker, maybe. Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker. She reminds me of Aunt Spiker, I think. That face with the... Um, um, what does it say? A moustache on her upper lip and a mouth as sour as a green gooseberry. <laughs> but by far the most loathsome thing about Mrs Pratchett was the filth that clung around her. Her apron was grey and greasy. Her blouse had brits of breakfast all over it, toast crumbs and tea stains and splotches of dried egg yolk. It was her hands, however, that disturbs us most. They were disgusting. They were black with dirt and grime. They looked as though they had been putting lumps of coal on the fire all day long. 
And do not forget, please, that it was these very hands and fingers that she plunged into the sweet jars when we asked for a pennyworth of treacle toffee or wine gums or nut clusters or whatever. There were precious few health laws in those days, and nobody, least of all Mrs. Pratchett, ever thought of using a little shovel for getting out the sweets as they do today. The mere sight of her grimy right hand with its black fingernails digging an ounce of chocolate fudge out of a jar would have caused the starving tramp to go running from the shop. But not us. Sweets were our life blood. We would have put up with far worse than that to get them. So we simply stood and watched in sullen silence while this disgusting old woman stirred around inside the jars with her foul fingers. And I, and I think that is um, the twits, right? All that dirt and grime, nasty twits. Um, yes, that's it. A licorice all sort. Um, cartwheels with a licorice all sort in the middle. Karen remembers. Um, yeah, pick and mix. So, uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to be... Um, and she even looks like... Uh, I haven't finished the chapter yet, but... She even looks like Mrs. Twit. <clears throat> the uh, old Mrs. Pratchett. The other thing we hated Mrs. Pratchett for was her meanness. Unless you spent a whole sixpence all in one go, she wouldn't give you a bag. Instead, you got your sweets twisted up in a small piece of newspaper which she tore off a pile of old daily mirrors lying on the counter. So you can well understand that we had it in for Mrs. Pratchett in a big way, but we didn't quite know what to do about it. Many schemes were put forward, but none of them was any good. None of them, that is, until suddenly, one memorable afternoon, we found a dead mouse. <laughs> like he says uh, at the beginning, it's, um, it is an autobiography, but it's, it's much better than a normal autobiography, isn't it? Because it's, it's written by Roald Dahl. So, yeah, I, I don't know, it's just so good. The Great Mouse Plot My four friends and I had come across a loose floorboard at the back of the classroom, and when we prized it up with the blade of a pocket knife, we discovered a big hollow space underneath. This, we decided, would be our secret hiding place for sweets and other small treasures, such as conkers and monkey nuts and birds' eggs. Every afternoon, when the last lesson was over, the five of us would wait until the classroom had emptied. Then we would lift up the floorboard and examine our secret hoard, perhaps adding to it or taking something away. One day, when we lifted it up, we found a dead mouse lying among our treasures. It was an exciting discovery. Thwaites took it out by its tail and waved it in front of our faces. "'What shall we do with it?' he cried. It stinks, someone shouted. Throw it out of the window, quick. Hold on a tick, I said. Don't throw it away. Yeah, well, Hannah, I think, um, in my opinion, David Williams, uh, he's a rip-off. He's ripped off um, Roald Dahl, so, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm not a fan of David Williams. I think he's a Dahl wannabe. So, um, sorry, Hannah, Hannah um, got me started there, but I'll I'll leave that alone. We don't have to get into that. Thwaites hesitated. They all looked at me. When writing about oneself, one must strive to be truthful. Truth is more important than modesty. I must tell you, therefore, that it was I and I alone who had the idea for the great and daring mouse plot. We all have our moments of brilliance and glory, and this was mine. Why don't we, I said, slip it into one of Mrs. Pratchett's jars of sweets? Then when she puts her dirty hand in to grab a handful, she'll grab a stinky dead mouse instead. <laughs> the other four stared at me in wonder. Then as the sheer genius of the plot began to sink in, they all started grinning. They slapped me on the back. They cheered me and danced around the classroom. We'll do it today, they cried. We'll do it on the way home. You had the idea, they said to me, so you can be the one to put the mouse in the jar. Thwaites handed me the mouse. I put it into my trouser pocket. 
Then the five of us left the school, crossed the village green and headed for the sweet shop. We were tremendously jazzed up. We felt like a gang of desperados sweated, setting out to rob a train or blow up the sheriff's office. Make sure you put it into a jar which is used often, somebody said. <laughs> I'm putting it in the gobstoppers, I said. The gobstopper jar is never behind the counter. I've got a penny, Thwaite said, so I'll ask for one sherbet sucker and one bootlace, and while she turns away to get them, you slip the mouse in quickly with the gobstoppers. Thus, everything was arranged. <laughs> Sorry, h hard to handle? Well, in, in the film, yeah? Meg Ryan, red boy in the film, or <clears throat> thus everything was arranged. We were strutting a little as we entered the shop. We were the victors now, and Mrs. Pratchett was the victim. She stood behind the counter, and her small, malignant pig eyes watched us suspiciously as we came forward. One sherbet sucker, please, Thwaites had told her, holding out his penny. I kept to the rear of the group, and when I saw Mrs. Pratchett turn her head away for a couple of seconds to fish a sherbet sucker out of the box, I lifted the heavy glass lid of the gobstopper jar and dropped the mouse in. Then I replaced the lid as silently as possible. My heart was thumping like mad, and my hands had gone all sweaty. And one bootlace, please, I heard Thwaites say. When I turned round, I saw Mrs. Pratchett holding out the bootlace in her filthy fingers. I don't want the lot of you trooping in here if only one of you is buying, she screamed. She screamed at us. Now beat it. Go on, get out. As soon as we were outside, we broke into a run. Did you do it? They shouted at me. Of course I did, I said. Well done you, they cried. What a super show. I felt like a hero. I was a hero. It was marvellous to be so popular. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, hard to handle. I didn't know that. Uh, I don't think I've even seen it. It's got Tom Hanks in as well, hasn't it? Um, I've seen it, but I've never watched it. Maybe I will if they've got... Must be a good writer if they've got Roald Dahl in there. <clears throat> Okay, next chapter. Mr. Coombs. The flush of triumph over the dead mouse was carried forward to the next morning as we all met again to walk to school. Let's go in and see if it's still in the jar, somebody said as we approached the sweet shop. Don't, Thwaite said firmly. It's too dangerous. Walk past as though nothing has happened. As we came level with the shop, we saw a cardboard notice hanging on the door. Closed. <laughs> We stopped and stared. We had never known the sweet shop to be closed at this time in the morning, even on Sundays. What's happened? We asked each other. What's going on? We pressed our faces against the window and looked inside. Mrs. Pratchett was nowhere to be seen. Look, I cried. The gobstopper jar's gone. It's not on the shelf. There's a gap where it used to be. It's on the floor, someone said. It's smashed to bits and there's gobstoppers everywhere. There's the mouse, someone else shouted. We could see it all. The huge glass jar smashed to smithereens with the dead mouse lying in the wreckage and hundreds of many-coloured gobstoppers littering the floor. She got a shock when she grabbed hold of the mouse that she dropped everything, somebody was saying. But why didn't she sweep it all up and open the shop, I asked. Nobody answered me. We turned away and walked towards the school. All of a sudden we had begun to feel slightly uncomfortable. There was something not quite right about the shop being closed. Even Thwaites was unable to offer a reasonable explanation. We became silent. There was, faint, there was a faint scent of danger in the air now. Each one of us had caught a whiff of it. Alarm bells were beginning to ring, faintly in our ears. Okay, hard to handle. Thank you. I, um, um, yeah, I'll be sure to check that one out. 
After a while, Thwaites broke the silence. She must have got one heck of a shock, he said. He paused. We all looked at him, wondering what wisdom the great medical authority was going to come out with next. After all, he went on, to catch hold of a dead mouse when you're expecting to catch hold of a gobstopper must be a pretty frightening experience, don't you agree? Nobody answered him. Well now, Thwaites went on, when an old person like Mrs Pratchett suddenly gets a very big shock, I suppose you know what happens next. What? we said. What happens? You ask my father, Thwaites said. He'll tell you. You tell us, we said. It gives her a heart attack, Thwaites announced. Her heart stops beating and she's dead in five seconds. For a moment or two, my own heart stopped beating. Thwaites pointed a finger at me and said darkly, I'm afraid you've killed her. Me? I cried. Why just me? It was your idea, he said, and what's more, you put the mouse in. All of a sudden, I was a murderer. At exactly that point, we heard the school bell ringing in the distance, and we had to gallop the rest of the way so as not to be late for prayers. Prayers were held in the assembly hall. We all perched in rows on wooden benches while the teachers sat up on the platform in armchairs facing us. The five of us scrambled into our places just as the headmaster marched in, followed by the rest of the staff. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying it, Mimi. Okay, I'm going to watch it hard to handle. So, yeah. Be good to have Roald Dahl back with us, hey? The headmaster is the only teacher at Landath Cathedral School that I can remember, and for a reason you will soon discover. I, I can remember him very clearly indeed. His name was Mr. Coombs, and I have a picture in my mind of a giant of a man with a face like a ham and a mass of rusty coloured hair that sprouted in a tangle all over the top of his head. All grown-ups appear as giants to small children, but headmasters and policemen are the biggest giants of all and acquire a marvellously exaggerated stature. It is possible that Mr. Coombs was a perfectly normal being, but in my memory he was a giant, a tweed-suited giant who always wore a black gown over his tweeds and a waistcoat under his jacket. <laughs> Hello there, Rondino Strings. Hello. And I'm glad you guys are enjoying the read. Thanks to Roald Dahl, hey? And I think Mr. Coombs may have inspired Mrs. Trunchbull. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to do a lot of these um, uh, references to other Roald Dahl books. <laughs> Mr. Coombs now proceeded to mumble through the same old prayers we had every day. But this morning, when the last Amen had been spoken, he did not turn and lead his group rapidly out of the hall as usual. He remained standing before us, and it was clear he had an announcement to make. The whole school is to go out and line up around the playground immediately, he said. Leave your books behind, and no talking. Mr. Coombs was looking grim. His hammy pink face had taken on that dangerous scowl, which only happens when he was extremely cross and somebody was for the high jump. I sat there small and frightened among the rows and rows of other boys, and to me at that moment the headmaster with his black gown draped over his shoulders was like a judge at a murder trial. He's after the killer, Thwaites whispered to me. I began to shiver. I'll bet the police are here already, Thwaites went on, and the Black Maria's waiting outside. As we made our way out to the playground, my whole stomach began to feel as though it was slowly filling up with swirling water. I'm only eight years old, I told myself. No little boy of eight has ever murdered anyone. It's not possible. Out in the playground on this warm, cloudy September morning, the deputy headmaster was shouting, Line up in forms! Sixth form over there, fifth form next to them. Spread out, spread out, get on with it. Stop talking, all of you. Thwaites and I and my other three friends were in the second form, the lowest but one, and we lined up against the red brick wall of the playground shoulder to shoulder. I can remember that when every boy in the school was in his place, the line stretched right around the four sides of the playground. About one hundred small boys altogether, aged between six and twelve, all of us wearing identical grey shorts and grey blazers and grey stockings and black shoes. 
Uh, is it's uh, yeah, it's not Vimto, but it's a uh, black currant juice, and I have a coffee as well, a mega coffee because it's a long read, so I need to drink a lot to keep the old um, the mouth dry <laughs> or wet even. Stop that talking! Shouted the deputy head. I want absolute silence. But why, for heaven's sake, were we in the playground at all, I wondered? And why were we lined up like this? It had never happened before. I half expected to see two policemen come bounding out of the school to grab me by the arms and put handcuffs on my wrist. A single door led out from the school onto the playground. Suddenly it swung open, and through it, like the angel of death, strode Mr. Coombs, huge and bulky in his tweed suit and black gown, and beside him, believe it or not, right beside him, trotted the tiny figure of Mrs. Pratchett herself. Mrs. Pratchett was alive. The relief was tremendous. She's alive, I whispered to Thwaites, standing next to me. I didn't kill her. Thwaites ignored me. We'll start over here, Mrs. Coombs was saying to Mrs. Mrs. Or Mr. Coombs was saying to Mrs. Pratchett. <laughs> he grasped he, he grasped her by one of her skinny arms and led her over to where the sixth form was standing. Then, still keeping hold of her arm, he proceeded to lead her at a brisk walk down the line of boys. It was like somebody inspecting the troops. What on earth are they doing? I whispered. Thwaites didn't answer me. I glanced at him. He had gone rather pale. Too big, I heard Mrs. Pratchett saying. Much too big. It's none of this lot. Let's have a look at some of them titchy ones. Mr. Coombs increased his pace. We'd better go all the way round, he said. He seemed in a hurry to get it over with now, and I could see Mrs. Pratchett's skinny goat's legs trotting to keep up with him. They had already inspected one side of the playground where the sixth form and half the fifth form were standing. We watched them moving down the second side, then the third side. Still too big, I heard Mrs. Pratchett croaking. Much too big, smaller than these, much smaller. Where's them nasty little ones? They were coming closer to us now, closer and closer. They were starting on the fourth side. Every boy in our form was watching Mr. Coombs and Mrs. Pratchett as they came walking down the line towards us. Nasty, cheeky lot, these little uns, I heard Mrs. Pratchett muttering. They comes into my shop and they thinks they can do what they damn well likes. Mr. Coombs made no reply to this. They nick things when I ain't looking, she went on. They put their grubby hands all over everything and they've got no manners. I don't mind girls, I never have no trouble with girls, but boys is idiots and horrible. I don't have to tell you that, Ed Master, do I? These are the smaller ones, Mr. Coombs said. I could see Mrs. Pratchett's piggy little eyes staring hard at the face of each boy she passed. Suddenly she let out a high-pitched yell and pointed a dirty finger straight at Thwaites. That's him, she yelled. That's one of them. I'd know him a mile away, the scummy little bounder. The entire school turned to look at Thwaites. What have I done? He stuttered, appealing to Mr. Coombs. Shut up, Mr. Coombs said. Mrs. Pratchett's eyes flicked over and settled on my own face. I looked down and studied the black asphalt surface of the playground. It is another of them, I heard her yelling. That one there, she pointed at me now. You're quite sure, Mr. Coombs said. Of course I'm sure, she cried. I never forgets a face, least of all when it's as sly as that. He's one of them, all right. There was five altogether. Now where's them other three? The other three, as I knew very well, were coming up next. Mrs. Pratchett's face was glimmering with venom as her eyes travelled beyond me down the line. There they are, she cried out, stabbing the air with her finger. I'm an I'm an I'm. That's five of them, all right. We don't need to look no farther than this, headmaster. They've, they're all here, the nasty little pigs. You've got their names, have you? I've got their names, Mrs. Pratchett, Mr. Coombs told her. I'm much obliged to you. And I'm much obliged to you, headmaster, she answered. As Mr. Coombs led her away across the playground, we heard her saying, Right in the jar of gobstop as it was, a stinking dead mouse, which I will never forget as long as I live. 
You have my deepest sympathy, Mr. Mr. Coombs was muttering. Talk about shock, she went on, when my fingers caught hold of that nasty, soggy, stinking dead mouse. Her voice trailed away as Mr. Coombs led her quickly through the door into the school building. <clears throat> yes, they're in trouble now. Consequences, eh? <clears throat> Mrs. Pratchett's Revenge oh. Our form master came into the classroom with a piece of paper in his hand. The following are to report to the headmaster's study at once, he said. Thwaites, Dahl, and then he read out the other three names, which I have forgotten. The five of us stood up and left the room. We didn't speak as we made our way down the long corridor into the headmaster's private quarters where the dreaded study was situated. Thwaites knocked at the door. Enter. We sidled in. The room smelled of leather and tobacco. Mr. Coombs was standing in the middle of it, dominating everything, a giant of a man if ever there was one, and in his hands he held a long yellow cane which curved round the top like a walking stick. I don't want any lies, he said. I know very well you did it and you are all in it together. Line up over there against the bookcase. We lined up, Thwaites in front and I, for some reason, at the very back. I was last in the line. You... Mr. Coombe said, pointing the cane at Thwaites. Come over here. Thwaites went forward very slowly. Bend over, <laughs> Mr. Coombe said. Thwaites bent over. Our eyes were riveted on him. We were hypnotised by it all. We knew, of course, that boys got the cane now and again, but we had never heard of anyone being made to watch. Tighter, boy, tighter, Mr. Coombe snapped out. Touch the ground. Thwaites touched the carpet with the tips of his fingers. Mr. Coombs stood back and took up a firm stance with his legs well apart. I thought how small Thwaites' bottom looked and how very tight it was. <laughs> Mr. Coombs has his eyes focused squarely upon it. He raised the cane high above his shoulder and as he brought it down it made a loud swishing sound and then there was a crack like a pistol shot as it struck Thwaites' bottom. Little Thwaites seemed to lift about a foot into the air, and he yelled, Ow! and straightened up like elastic. Yeah, I think you're right there, um, Rondino. He, he definitely does uh, all of these. His, well, of course, his life informs his, uh, his fiction. Oh, here we go. Arda! shrieked a voice from over in the corner. Now it was our turn to jump. We looked round and there, sitting in one of Mr. Coombs's big leather chairs, was the tiny loathsome figure of Mrs. Pratchett. She was bounding up and down with excitement. Lay it into him, she was shrieking. Let him have it. Teach him a lesson. Get down, boy, Mr. Coombs ordered, and stay down. You get an extra one every time you straighten up. That's telling him, shrieked Mrs. Pratchett. That's telling the little blighter. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. It was like some awful pantomime. The violence was bad enough, and being made to watch it was even worse. But with Mrs. Pratchett in the audience, the whole thing became a nightmare. Swish crack, went the cane. Ow, yelled Thwaites. Arda, shrieked Mrs. Pratchett. Stitch him up. Make it sting. Tickle him up. Good and proper. Warm his backside for him. Go on. Warm it up, headmaster. Thwaites received four strokes and by gum. There were four real whoppers. Next, snapped Mr. Coombs. Thwaites came hopping past us on his toes, clutching his bottom with both hands and yelling, Ow! Ouch! 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 Ow! With tremendous reluctance, the next boy sidled forward to his fate. I stood there wishing I hadn't been last in the line. The watching and waiting were probably even greater torture than the event itself. Oh, really, Hannah? Yeah, I can't imagine it. The, the cane wasn't in, um, in circulation when I was at school, but, yeah, shocking. And, and to have... Um, Ultimately, a member of the public, a member of the public sitting in the corner watching the show is uh, pretty shocking. 
Mr. Coombs's performance the second time was the same as the first. So was Mrs. Pratchett's. She kept up her screeching all the way through, exhorting Mr. Coombs to greater and still greater efforts. And the awful thing was that he seemed to be responding to her cries. He was like an athlete who is spurred on by the shouts of the crowd in the stands. Whether this was true or not, I was sure of one thing. He wasn't weakening. My own turn came at last. My mind was swimming and my eyes had gone all blurry, and I went forward to bend over. I can remember wishing my mother would suddenly come bursting into the room, shouting, Stop! How dare you do that to my son? But she didn't. All I heard was Mrs. Pratchett's dreadful high-pitched voice behind me, screeching, This one's the cheekiest of the blooming lot, Edmaster. Make sure you let him have it, good and strong. <clears throat> Mr. Coombs did just that. As the first stroke landed and the pistol crack sounded, I was thrown forward so violently that my, if my fingers hadn't been touching the carpet, I think I would have fallen flat on my face. As it was, I was able to catch myself on the palm of my hands and keep my balance. At first I heard only the crack and felt absolutely nothing at all, but a fraction of a second later the burning sting that flooded across my buttocks was so terrific that all I could do was gasp. I gave a great gushing gasp that emptied my lungs of every breath of air that was in them. It felt, I promise you, as though someone had laid a red-hot poker against my flesh and was pressing down on it hard. The second stroke was worse than the first, and this was probably because Mr. Coombs was well practised and had a splendid aim. He was able, so it seemed, to land the second one almost across the narrow line where the first one had struck. It is bad enough when the cane lands on fresh skin, but when it comes down on bruised and wounded flesh, the agony is unbelievable. The third one seemed even worse than the second. Whether or not the wily Mr. Coombs had chalked the cane beforehand and thus made an aiming mark on my grey flannel shorts after the first stroke, I do not know. I am inclined to doubt it, because he must have known that this was a practice much frowned upon by headmasters in general in those days. It was not only only regarded as unsporting, it was also an admission that you were not an expert at the job. <laughs> well, that's good news, Hannah, that you don't have that memory to uh, fall back on. Hey, Dark Fur, hiya, thank you very much. And uh, if you can see, guys, that's a great way to support here. Dark Fur with a super sticker. I appreciate that very much. And thank you, Hard to Handle. Thank you. By the time the fourth stroke was delivered, my entire backside seemed to be going up in flames. Far away in the distance, I heard Mr. Coombe's voice saying, Now get out. As I limped across the study, clutching my buttocks hard with both hands, a cackling sound came from the armchair over in the corner, and then I heard the vinegary voice of Mrs. Pratchett saying, "'I'm very much obliged to you, Edmaster, very much obliged. I don't think I'm, we is going to see any more stinking mice in my gobstoppers from now on.' When I returned to the classroom, my eyes were wet with tears and everybody stared at me. My bottom hurt when I sat down at my desk. That evening after supper, my three sisters had their baths before me. Then it was my turn. But as I was about to step into the bathtub, I heard a horrified gasp from my mother behind me. "'What's this?' she gasped. "'What's happened to you?' She was staring at my bottom. I myself had not inspected it up to then, but when I twisted my head round and looked at one of my buttocks, I saw the scarlet stripes and the deep blue bruising in between. "'Who did this?' my mother cried. "'Tell me at once.' In the end, I had to tell her the whole story, while my three sisters, aged nine, six and four, stood around in their nighties, listening, goggle-eyed. My mother heard me out in silence. She asked no questions, she just let me talk, and when I had finished, she said to our nurse, You get them to bed, Nanny, I'm going out. If I had the slightest idea of what she was going to do next, I would have tried to stop her, but I hadn't. She went straight downstairs and put on her hat. Then she marched out of the house, down the drive and onto the road. I saw her through my bedroom window as she went out of the gates and turned left. I remember calling out to her to come back, come back, come back, but she took no notice of me. She was walking very quickly with her head held high and her body erect, and by the look of things, I figured that Mr. Coombs was in for a hard time. 
About an hour later, my mother returned and came upstairs to kiss us all good night. I wish you hadn't done that, I said to her. It makes me look silly. They don't beat small children like that where I come from, she said. I won't allow it. What did Mr. Coombe say to you, Mama? He told me that I was a foreigner and I didn't understand how British schools were run, she said. Did he get ratty with you? Very ratty, she said. He told me that if I didn't like his methods, I could take you away. What did you say? I said I would as soon as the school year is finished. I shall find you an English school this time, she said. Your father was right. English schools are the best in the world. Does that mean it'll be a boarding school, I asked. It'll have to be, she said. I'm not quite ready to move the whole family to England yet. So I stayed on at Landath Cathedral School until the end of the summer term. <laughs> Going to Norway The summer holidays, those magic words The mere mention of them used to send shivers of joy rippling over my skin All my summer holidays from when I was four years old to when I was 17, 1920 to 1932, were totally idyllic. This, I am certain, was because we always went to the same idyllic place, and that place was Norway. Except for my ancient half-sister and my not-quite-so-ancient half-brother, the rest of us were all pure Norwegian by blood. We all spoke Norwegian and all our relations lived over there. So, in a way, going to Norway every summer was like going home. Even the journey was an event. Do not forget that there were no commercial aeroplanes in those times, so it took us four whole days to complete the trip and trip out and another four days to get home again. Hey, Rondino Strings. Thank you too. Bravo. Thanks very much, guys. Fantastic. <laughs> <clears throat> we were always an enormous party. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We were always an enormous party. There were my three sisters and my ancient half-sister, that's four, and my half-brother and me, that's six, and my mother, that's seven, and nanny, that's eight. And in addition to these, there were never less than two others who were some sort of an anonymous ancient friends of the ancient half-sister, that's ten altogether. Looking back on it now, I don't know how my mother did it. There were all those train bookings and boat bookings and hotel bookings to be made in advance by letter. She had to make sure that we had enough shorts and shirts and sweaters and gym shoes and bathing costumes. You couldn't even buy a shoelace on the island we were going to. And the packing must have been a nightmare. Six huge trunks were carefully packed, as well as countless suitcases, and when the great departure day arrived, the ten of us, together with our mountains of luggage, would set out on the first and easiest step of the journey, the train to London. When we arrived in London, we tumbled into three taxis and went clattering across the great city to King's Cross, where we got on to the train for Newcastle, nearly three hundred miles to the north. The trip to Newcastle took about five hours, and when we arrived there, we needed three more taxis to take us from the station to the docks, where our boat would be waiting. The next stop after that would be to Oslo, the capital of Norway. When I was young, the capital of Norway was not called Oslo. It was called Christiania. But somewhere along the line, the Norwegians decided to do away with that pretty name and called it Oslo instead. As children, we always knew it as Christiania, but if I call it that here, we shall only get confused. So I, so, so I had better stick to Oslo all the way through. The sea journey from Newcastle to Oslo took two days and a night, and if it was rough, as it often was, all of us got seasick, except our dauntless mother. We used to lie in deck chairs on the promenade deck, with easy, within easy reach of the rails, embalmed in rugs, our faces slate grey and our stomachs churning, refusing the hot soup and ship's biscuits the kindly steward kept offering us. And as for poor Nanny, she began to feel sick the moment she set foot on deck. I hate these things, she used to say. I'm sure we'll never get there. Which lifeboat do we go to when it starts to sink? 
Then she would retire to her cabin where she stayed, groaning and trembling until the ship was firmly tied up at the quayside in Oslo harbour the next day. We always stopped off for one night in Oslo so that we could have a grand annual family reunion with Besta Mama and Besta Papa, our mother's parents, and with her two maiden sisters, our aunts, who lived in the same house. When we got off the boat, we all went in a cavalcade of taxis straight to the Grand Hotel, where we would sleep one night to drop off our luggage. Then, keeping the same taxis, we drove on to the grandparents' house, where an emotional welcome awaited us. All of us were embraced and kissed many times, and tears flowed down wrinkled old cheeks, and suddenly that quiet, gloomy house came alive with many children's voices. Ever since I first saw her, Besta Mama was terrifically ancient. She was a white-haired, wrinkly-faced old bird who seemed always to be sitting in a rocking chair rocking away and smiling benignly at this vast influx of grandchildren who barged in from miles away to take over her house for a few hours every year. Maybe, um, Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, Charlie's uh, grandparents, perhaps? Best of Papa was the quiet one. He was a small, dignified scholar with a white goatee beard, and as far as I could gather, he was an astrologer, a meteorologist and a speaker of ancient Greek. Like Best of Mama, he sat most of the time quietly in a chair, saying very little and totally overwhelmed. I imagine by the, ra the raucous rabble who were destroying his neat and polished home. The two things I remember most about Bester Papa were that he wore black boots and that he smoked an extraordinary pipe. The bowl of this pipe was made of meerschaum clay and it had a flexible stem about three feet long so that the bowl rested on his lap. All the grown-ups, including Nanny and all the children, even when the youngest was only a year old, sat down around the big oval dining room table on the afternoon of our arrival for the great annual celebration feast with the grandparents, and the food we received never varied. This was a Norwegian household, and for the Norwegians the best food in the world is fish. And when they say fish, they don't mean the sort of thing you and I get from the fishmonger, they mean fresh fish, fish that has been caught no more than 24 hours before and has never been frozen or chilled on a block of ice. I agree with them that the proper way to prepare, to prepare fish like this is to poach it, and that is what they do with the finest specimens. And Norwegians, by the way, always eat the skin of the boiled fish, which they say has the best taste of all. So naturally this great celebration feast started with fish. A massive fish, a flounder as big as a tea tray and as thick as your arm, was brought to the table. It had nearly black skin on top which was covered with brilliant orange spots and it had of course been perfectly poached. Large white hunks of this fish were carved out and put onto our plates and with it we had hollandaise sauce and boiled new potatoes, nothing else, and by gosh it was delicious. As soon as the remains of the fish had been cleared away, a tremendous craggy mountain of homemade ice cream would be carried in. Apart from being the creamiest ice cream in the world, the flavour was unforgettable. There were thousands of little chips of crisp burnt toffee mixed into it. The Norwegians called it crocan, and as a result it didn't simply melt in your mouth like ordinary ice cream. You chewed it and it went crunch, and the taste was something you dreamed about for days afterwards. This great feast would be interrupted by a small speech of welcome from my grandfather, and the grown-ups would raise their long-stemmed wine glasses and say skal many times throughout the meal. When the guzzling was over, those who were considered old enough were given small glasses of homemade liquor, a colourless but fiery drink that smelled of mulberries. The glasses were raised again and the scarling seemed to go on forever. In Norway you may select an individual around the table and scarl him or her in a, pr in a small private ceremony. You first lift your glass high and call out the name. Besta Mama, you say, scarl Besta Mama. She will then lift her own glass and hold it up high. At the same time, your own eyes meet hers, and you must keep looking deep into her eyes as you sip your drink. 
After you have both done this, you raise your glasses high up again in a sort of silent final salute, and only then does each person look away and set down his glass. It is a serious and solemn ceremony, and as a rule on formal occasions everyone scarls everyone else around the table once. If there are, for example, ten people present, and you are one of them, you will scarl your nine companions, one each individually, and you yourself will also receive nine separate scarls at different times during the meal. Eighteen in all. That's how they work it in polite society over there. At least they used to in the old days, and quite a business it was. By the time I was ten, I would be permitted to take part in these ceremonies, and I always finished up as tipsy as a lord. Uh, yes, Dark Fur, um, sorry, I finished the chapter. I wanted to finish the chapter before I address the chat, otherwise, um, yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, yeah, I think um, if I remember Dark Fur, Grandma Georgina, George, Josephine, and Joe, if I remember rightly. Uh, Jill says, um, holiday. Um, uh, Jill, uh, when you go on holiday, does that mean to another country or just a vacation? Is it a structured vacation or not? I think it's um, when you go away, just anywhere away from home. You could even go sort of five miles up the road. I suppose that would be considered a holiday. A holiday anywhere away from your home where you'd normally live. And a lumpy horse, thank you very much. Uh, you're very welcome. I love reading to you all, so, um, yeah, you're welcome, and there are Hannah, uh, so this is absolutely brilliant, I appreciate it, um, very much, you guys are spoiling me, <laughs> the Magic Island, the next morning everyone got up early and eager to continue the journey. There was another full day's travelling to be done before we reached our final destination, most of it by boat. So after a rapid breakfast, our cavalcade left the Grand Hotel in three more taxis and headed for Oslo Docks. And I think um, in the witches, um, the witches, it's called the Grand Hotel, so... Um, There we went on board a small coastal steamer, and Nanny was heard to say, I'm sure it leaks. We shall all be food for the fishes before the day is out. Then she would disappear below for the rest of the trip. We loved this part of the journey. The splendid little vessel with its single tall funnel would move out into the calm waters of the fjord and proceed at a leisurely pace along the coast, stopping every hour or so at a small wooden jetty where a group of villagers and summer people would be waiting to welcome friends or to collect parcels and mail. Unless you have sailed down the, Os the Oslo Fjord like this yourself on a tranquil summer's day, you cannot imagine what it was like. It is impossible to describe the sensation of absolute peace and beauty that surrounds you. The boat weaves in and out, between countless tiny islands, some with small, brightly painted wooden houses on them, but many with not a house or a tree on the bare rocks. These granite rocks are so smooth that you can lie and sun yourself on them in your bathing costume without putting a towel underneath. We would see long-legged girls and tall boys basking on the rocks of the islands. There are no sandy beaches on the fjord. The rocks go straight down to the water's edge, and the water is immediately deep. As a result, Norwegian children all learn to swim when they are very young, because if you can't swim, it is difficult to find a place to bathe. Sometimes, when our little vessels slip between two small islands, the channel was so narrow we could almost touch the rocks on either side. We would pass rowboats and canoes with flaxen-haired children in them, their skins browned by the sun, and we would wave to them and watch their tiny boats rocking violently in the swell that our larger ship left behind. 
Late in the afternoon, we would come finally to the end of the journey. <laughs> yes, Hannah, it's a, it's a good show. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Late in the afternoon, we would come finally to the end of the journey, the island of Tome. I think you pronounce it. It's a Norwegian word, so I'm just going to go with Tome. This was where our mother always took us. Heaven knows how she find it, but to us it was the greatest place on earth. About two hundred yards from the jetty along a narrow dusty road stood a simple wooden hotel painted white. It was run by an elderly couple whose faces I still remember vividly, and every year they welcomed us like old friends. Everything about the hotel was extremely primitive, except the dining room. The walls, the ceiling and the floor of our bedrooms were made of plain unvarnished pine planks. There was a wash basin and a jug of cold water in each of them. The lavatories were in a rickety wooden outhouse at the back of the hotel and each cubicle contained nothing more than a round hole cut in a piece of wood. You sat on the hole and what you did there dropped into a pit ten feet below. If you looked down the hole you would often see rats scurrying about in the gloom. All this we took for granted. Breakfast was the best meal of the day in our hotel, and it was all laid out on a huge table in the middle of the dining room from which you helped yourself. There were maybe fifty different dishes to choose from on that table. There were large jugs of milk, which all Norwegian children drink at every meal. There were plates of cold beef, veal, ham and pork. There was cold boiled mackerel submerged in aspic. There were spiced and pickled herring fillets, sardines, smoked eels and cod's roe. There was a large bowl piled high with hot boiled eggs. There were cold omelettes with chopped ham in them and cold chicken and hot coffee for the grown-ups and hot crisp rolls baked in the hotel kitchen which we ate with butter and cranberry jam. It's making me hungry. There were stewed apricots and five or six different cheeses, including, of course, the ever-present gatost, the tall, brown, rather sweet Norwegian goat's cheese, which you find on just about every table in the land. After breakfast, we collected our bathing things, and the whole party, all ten of us, would pile into our boat. <laughs> Everyone has some sort of boat in Norway. Nobody sits around in front of the hotel, nor does anyone sit on the beach, because there aren't any beaches to sit on. In the early days we had only a rowboat, but a very fine one it was. It carried all of us easily with places for two rowers. My mother took one pair of oars, and my fairly ancient half-brother took the other, and off we would go. My mother and the half-brother, he was somewhere around eighteen then, were expert rowers. They kept in perfect time, and the oars went click-click, click-click in their wooden rowlocks, and the rowers never paused once during the long forty-minute journey. The rest of us sat in the boat, trailing our fingers in the clear water, and looking for jellyfish. We skimmed across the sound, and went whizzing through narrow channels with rocky islands on either side, heading, as always, for a very secret tiny patch of sand on a distant island that only we knew about. In the early days we needed a place like this where we could paddle and play about, because my youngest sister was only one, the next sister was three, and I was four. The rocks and the deep water were no good to us. Every day for several summers that tiny secret sand patch on that tiny secret island was our regular destination. We would stay there for three or four hours messing about in the water and in the rock pools and getting extraordinarily sunburnt. In later years, when we were all a little older and could swim, the daily routine became different. By then, my mother had acquired a motorboat, a small and not very seaworthy white wooden vessel which sat far too low in the water and was powered by an unreliable, unreliable one-cylinder engine. The fairly ancient half-brother was the only one who could make the engine go at all. It was extremely difficult to start, and he always had to unscrew the sparking plug and pour petrol into the cylinder. Then he swung a flywheel round and round, and with a bit of luck, after a lot of coughing and spluttering, the thing would finally get going. When we first acquired the motorboat, my youngest sister was four, and I was seven, and by then all of us had learned to swim. 
The exciting new boat made it possible for us to go much further afield, and every day we would travel far out into the fjord, hunting for a different island. There were hundreds of them to choose from. Some were very small, no more than thirty yards along. Others were quite large, maybe half a mile in length. It was wonderful to have such a choice of places, and it was terrific fun to explore each island before we went swimming off the rocks. There were the wooden skeletons of shipwrecked boats on these islands, and big white bones, were they human bones, and wild raspberries and mussels clinging to the rocks, and some of the islands had shaggy long-haired goats on them, and even sheep. Now and again, when we were out in the open water beyond the chain of islands, the sea became very rough, and that was when my mother enjoyed herself most. Nobody, not even the tiny children, bothered with life belts in those days. We would cling to the sides of our funny little white motorboat, driving through mountainous white-capped waves and getting drenched to the skin, while my mother calmly handled the tiller. There were times, I promise you, when the waves were so high that as we slid down into the trough, the whole world disappeared from sight. Then up and up the little boat would climb, standing almost vertically on its tail, until we reached the crest of the next wave, and then it was like being on top of a foaming mountain. It requires great skill to handle a small boat in seas like these. The thing can easily capsize or be swamped if the bows do not meet the great combing breakers at just the right angle. But my mother knew exactly how to do it, and we were never afraid. We loved every minute of it, all of us except for our long-suffering nanny, who would bury her face in her hands and call aloud upon the Lord to save her soul. In the early evenings we nearly always went out fishing. We collected mussels from the rocks for bait, then we got into either the rowboat or the motorboat and pushed off to drop anchor later in some likely spot. The water was very deep, and often we had to let out two hundred feet of line before we touched the bottom. We would sit silent and tense, waiting for a bite, and it always amazed me how even a little nibble at the end of that long line would be transmitted to one's fingers. A bite, someone would shout, jerking the line. I've got him. It's a big one. It's a whopper. And then came the thrill of hauling in the line, hand over hand, and peering over the side into the clear water to see how big the fish really was as he neared the surface. Cod, whiting, haddock, and mackerel. We caught them all and bore them back triumphantly to the hotel kitchen, where the cheery fat woman who did the cooking promised to get them ready for our supper. I tell you, my friends, those were the days. Yes, Dark Fur, he's a wonderful writer, isn't he? Uh, A visit to the doctor. I have only one unpleasant memory of the summer holidays in Norway. We were in the grandparents' house in Oslo, and my mother said to me, We are going to the doctor this afternoon. He wants to look at your nose and mouth. I think I was eight at the time. What's wrong with my nose and mouth? I asked. Nothing much, my mother said, but I think you've got adenoids. What are they? I asked her. Don't worry about it, she said. It's nothing. I held my mother's hand as we walked to the doctor's house. It took us about half an hour. There was a kind of dentist chair in the surgery, and I was lifted into it. The doctor had a round mirror strapped to his forehead, and he peered up my nose and into my mouth. He then took my mother aside, and they held a whispered conversation. I saw my mother looking rather grim, but she nodded. The doctor now put some water to boil in, in an aluminium mug over a gas flame, and into the boiling water he placed a long, thin, shiny steel instrument. I sat there watching the steam coming off the boiling water. I was not in the least apprehensive. I was too young to realise that something out of the ordinary was going to happen. Then a nurse, dressed in white, came in. She was carrying a red rubber apron and a carved white enamel bowl. She put the apron over the front of my body and tied it around my neck. It was far too big. Then she held the enamel bowl under my chin. The curve of the bowl fitted perfectly against the curve of my chest. The doctor was bending over me. In his hand he held that long, shiny steel instrument. He held it right in front of my face, and to this day I can still describe it perfectly. 
It was about the thickness and length of a pencil, and like most pencils it had a lot of sides to it. Towards the end the metal became thin, much thinner, and at the very end of the thin bit of metal there was a tiny blade set at an angle. The blade wasn't more than a centimetre long, very small, very sharp, and very shiny. <laughs> Open your mouth, the doctor said, speaking Norwegian. I refused. I thought he was going to do something to my teeth, and, every th and anything anyone had ever done to my teeth had been painful. It won't take two seconds, the doctor said. He spoke gently, and I was seduced by his voice. Like an ass, I opened my mouth. The tiny blade flashed in the bright light and disappeared into my mouth. It went high up into the roof of my mouth, and the hand that held the blade gave four or five very quick little twists, and the next moment out of my mouth and into the basin came, thumb, came tumbling a whole mass of flesh and blood. I was too shocked and outraged to do anything but yelp. I was horrified by the huge red lumps that had fallen out of my mouth into the white basin, and my first thought was that the doctor had cut out the whole of the middle of my head. <laughs> Those were your adenoids, I heard the doctor saying. I sat there gasping. The roof of my mouth seemed to be on fire. I grabbed my mother's hand and held on to it tight. I couldn't believe that anyone would do this to me. Stay where you are, the doctor said. You'll be all right in a minute. Blood was still coming out of my mouth and dripping into the basin the nurse was holding. Spit it all out, she said. There's a good boy. You'll be able to breathe much better through your nose after this, the doctor said. The nurse wiped my lips and washed my face with a wet flannel. Then they lifted me out of the chair and stood me on my feet. I felt a bit groggy. We'll get you home, my mother said, taking my hand. Down the stairs we went and onto the street. We started walking. I said walking. No trolley car or taxi. We walked the full half-hour journey back to my grandparents' house, and when we arrived at last, I can remember as clearly as anything my grandmother saying, Let him sit down in that chair and rest for a while. After all, he's had an operation. Someone placed a chair for me beside my grandmother's armchair, and I sat down. My grandmother reached over and covered one of my hands in both of hers. That won't be the last time you'll go to a doctor in your life, she said, and with a bit of luck they won't do too much harm. That was in 1924, and taking out a child's adenoids, and often the tonsils as well, without any anaesthetic, was common practice in those days. I wonder, though, what would you think if some doctor did that to you today? <laughs> Yeah, especially with um, without any warning or sort of letting you know what was going on. <clears throat> so now we're on to the next part. St. Peter's, 1925 to 1929, age 9 till 11. The first day. In September 1925, when I was just nine, I set out on the first great adventure of my life, boarding school. My mother had chosen for me a prep school in a part of England which was as near as it could possibly be to our home in South Wales, and it was called St Peter's. The full postal address was St Peter's School, Western Supermare, Somerset. Western Supermare is a slightly seedy seaside resort with a vast sandy beach, a tremendous long pier, an esplanade running along the seafront, a clutter of hotels and boarding houses, and about 10,000 little shops selling buckets and spades and sticks of rock and ice creams. It lies almost directly across the Bristol Channel from Cardiff, and on a clear day you can stand on the esplanade, or esplanade, at Weston, and look across the fifteen or so miles of water and see the coast of Wales lying pale and milky on the horizon. In those days, the easiest way to travel from Cardiff to Weston Supermare was by boat. These boats were beautiful. They were paddle steamers with gigantic swishing paddle wheels on their flanks, and the wheels made the most terrific noise as they sloshed and churned through the water. On the first day of my first term, I set out by taxi in the afternoon with my mother to catch the paddle steamer from Cardiff Docks to Western Supermare. 
Every piece of clothing I wore was brand new and had my name on it. I wore black shoes, grey woollen stockings with blue turnovers, grey flannel shorts, a grey shirt, a red tie, a grey flannel blazer with a blue school crest on the breast pocket, and a grey school cap with the same crest just above the peak. Into the taxi that was taking us to the docks went my brand new trunk and my brand new tuck box, and both had R. Dahl painted on them in black. A tuck box is a small pinewood trunk which is very strongly made and no boy has ever gone as a boarder to any English prep school without one. It is his own secret storehouse, as, a, as secret as a lady's handbag and there is an unwritten law that no other boy, no teacher, not even the headmaster himself has the right to pry into the contents of your tuck box. The owner has the key in his pocket and that is where it stays. At St. Peter's, the tuck boxes were ranged shoulder to shoulder all round the four walls of the changing room, and your own tuck box stood directly below the peg on which you hung your game's clothes. A tuck box, as the name implies, is a box in which you store your tuck. At prep school in those days, a parcel of tuck was sent once a week by anxious mothers to their ravenous little sons, and an average tuck box would probably contain, at almost any time, half a homemade currant cake, a packet of squashed fly biscuits, a couple of oranges, an apple, a banana, a pot of strawberry jam or marmite, a bar of chocolate, a bag of licorice all sorts and a tin of Bassett's lemonade power. An English school in those days was purely a money-making business, owned and operated by the headmaster. It suited him, therefore, to give the boys as little food as possible himself and to encourage the parents in various cunning ways to feed their offspring by parcel post from home. Hey, King Arjun. Nice to see you. Welcome and hello. <clears throat> By all means, my dear Mrs. Dahl, do send your boy some little treats now and again, he would say. Perhaps a few oranges and apples once a week. Fruit was very expensive, and a nice currant cake. A large currant cake, perhaps, because small boys have large appetites. Do they not? <laughs> yes, yes, as often as you like. More than once a week, if you wish. Of course he'll be getting plenty of good food here. The best there is, but it never tastes quite the same as home cooking, does it? I'm sure you wouldn't want him to be the only one who doesn't get a lovely parcel from home every week. As well as tuck, a tuck box would also contain all manner of treasures such as a magnet, a pocket knife, a compass, a ball of string, a clockwork racing car, half a dozen lead soldiers, a box of conjuring tricks, some tiddlywinks, a Mexican jumping bean, a catapult, some foreign stamps, a couple of stink bombs, and I remember... One boy called Arkel, who drilled an air hoe in the lid of his tuck box and kept a pet frog in there, which he fed on slugs. So off we set, my mother and I, my trunk and my tuck box, and we boarded the paddle steamer and went swooshing across the Bristol Channel in a shower of spray. I liked that part of it, but I began to grow apprehensive as I disembarked onto the pier at Western Supermare and watched my trunk and tuck box being loaded into an English taxi which would drive us to St. Peter's. I had absolutely no idea what was in store for me. I had never spent a single night away from our large family home before. St. Peter's was on a hill above the town. It was a long three-storied stone building that looked rather like a private lunatic asylum, and in front of it lay the playing fields with their three football pitches. One third of the building was reserved for the headmaster and his family. The rest of it housed the boys, about 150 of them altogether, if I remember rightly. As we got out of the taxi, I saw the whole driveway a bustle with small boys and their parents and their trunks and their tuck boxes, and a man I took to be the headmaster was swimming around among them, shaking everybody by the hand. I've already told you that all headmasters are giants, and this one was no exception. He advanced upon my mother and shook her by the hand, and then shook me by the hand, and as he did so, he gave me the kind of flashing grin a shark might give to a small fish just before he gobbles it up. One of his front teeth, I noticed, was edged all the way round with gold, and his hair was slicked down with so much hair cream that it glistened like butter. Right, he said to me, off you go and report to the matron, 
and to my mother he said briskly, Goodbye, Mrs. Dahl. I shouldn't linger if I were you. We'll look after him. My mother got the message. She kissed me on the cheek and said goodbye and climbed right back into the taxi. The headmaster moved away to another group and I was left standing there beside my brand new trunk and my brand new tuck box. I began to cry. Right guys, sorry, I'm just going to um, go and use the toilet quickly because it's uh, quite distracting sitting here needing the toilet. So I'll be back in um, one minute. Hello there, sorry about that, but nature calls and uh, I see a few of you are, um, yeah, topping up your own teas and coffees and all that, so, um, um, yeah, but I'm, I'm back now, so, I hope those of you who have gone to make a tea or a coffee um, or break time have, have took your devices with you so that we can get right back into the story, so, this next chapter, <laughs> I'm a bit out of breath. <laughs> this next chapter is called Writing Home. At St. Peter's, Sunday morning was letter writing time. At nine o'clock, the whole school had to go to their desks and spend one hour writing a letter home to their parents. At 10.15, we put on our caps and coats and formed up outside the school in a long crocodile and marched a couple of miles down into Western Supermare for church, and we didn't get back until lunchtime. Church going never became a habit with me. Letter writing did. <laughs> the, the Harry Potter mega mug is that dark fur. <laughs> Here is the very first letter I wrote home from St. Peter's and there's an image of it and this, um, I'm not going to try and write, read it, sorry, because the, the writing's not, um, I probably could, but no, I'm not going to read it because it's, um, it's obviously handwritten. From that very first Sunday at St. Peter's until the day my mother died 32 years later, I wrote to her once a week, sometimes more often, whenever I was away from home. I wrote to her every week from St. Peter's, I had to, and every week from my next school, Repton, and every week from Dar el Salam, Dar es Salam in East Africa, where I went on my first job after leaving school, and then every week during the war from Kenya and Iraq and Egypt when I was flying with the RAF, all of which we'll get to um, next weekend, next Sunday, um, in Going Solo, his war efforts. My mother, for her part, kept every one of these letters, binding them carefully in neat bundles with green tape, but this was her own secret. She never told me she was doing it. In 1957, when she knew she was dying, I was in hospital in Oxford having a serious operation on my spine and was unable to write to her. 
so she had a telephone specially installed beside her bed in order that she might have one last conversation with me. She didn't tell me she was dying, nor did anyone else for that matter, because I was in a fairly serious condition myself at the time. She simply asked me how I was and hoped I would get better soon and sent me her love. I had no idea that she would die the next day, but she knew all right, and she wanted to reach out and speak to me for the last time. When I recovered and went home, I was given this vast collection of my letters, all so neatly bound with green tape, more than 600 of them altogether, dating from 1925 to 1945, each one in its original envelope with the old stamp still on them. I'm awfully lucky to have something like this to refer to in my old age. Letter writing was a serious business at St. Peter's. It was as much a lesson in spelling and punctuation as anything else, because the headmaster would patrol the classrooms all through the session, peering over our shoulders to read what we were writing and to point out our mistakes. But that, I am quite sure, was not the main reason for his interest. He was there to make sure that we said nothing horrid about his school. There was no way, therefore, that we could ever complain to our parents about anything during term time. If we thought the food was lousy, or if we hated a certain master, or if we had been thrashed for something we did not do, we never dared to say so in our letters. In fact, we often went the other way, in order to please that dangerous headmaster, who was leaning over our shoulders and reading what we had written, we would say splendid things about the school and go on about how lovely the masters were. Mind you, the headmaster was a clever fellow. He did not want our parents to think that those letters of ours were censored in this way, and therefore he never allowed us to correct a spelling mistake in the letter itself. If, for example, I had written, Last Tuesday night we had a lecture, he would say, Do you know how to spell night? Yes, sir. K-N-I-G-H-T. That's the other kind of night, you idiot. Which kind, sir? I, I don't understand. The one in shining armour. The man on horseback. How do you spell Tuesday night? I, I, I'm not quite sure, sir. It's N-I-G-H-T, boy. N-I-G-H-T. Stay in and write it out for me fifty times this afternoon. No, no, don't change it in the letter. You don't want to make it any messier than it is. It must go as you wrote it. Thus the unsuspecting parents received in this subtle way the impression that your letter had never been seen or censored or corrected by anyone. And uh, that scene there is obviously... Um, goes straight into Matilda, doesn't it? Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, Dark Fur says, um, yeah... That's the trunchbull doing the spelling and punishing the children. And hello there, Beth. <laughs> the Matron At St. Peter's, the ground floor was all classrooms. The first floor was all dormitories. On the dormitory floor, the matron ruled supreme. This was her territory. Hers was the only voice of authority up here, and even the eleven and twelve-year-old boys were terrified of this female ogre, for she ruled with a rod of steel. More trunchable by the sounds of it. The matron was a large, fair-haired woman with a bosom. Her age was probably no more than twenty-eight, but it made no difference whether she was twenty-eight or sixty-eight, because to us a grown-up was a grown-up, and all grown-ups were dangerous creatures at this school. Once you had climbed to the top of the stairs and set foot on the dormitory floor, you were in matron's power, and the, and the source of this power was the unseen but frightening figure of the headmaster lurking down in the depths of his study below. At any time she liked, the matron could send you down in your pyjamas and dressing gown to report to this merciless giant, and whenever this happened, you got caned on the spot. The matron knew this, and she relished the whole business. <laughs> she
She could move along that corridor like lightning, and when you least expected it, her head and her bosom would come popping through the dormitory doorway. Who threw that sponge? The dreaded voice would call out. It was you, Perkins, was it not? Don't lie to me, Perkins. Don't argue with me. I know perfectly well it was you. Now you can put your dressing gown on and go downstairs and report to the headmaster this instant. In slow motion and with immense reluctance, little Perkins, aged eight and a half, would get into his dressing gown and slippers and disappear down the long corridor that led to the back stairs and the headmaster's private quarters. And the matron, as we all knew, would follow after him and stand at the top of the stairs, listening with a funny look on her face for the crack, crack, crack of the cane that would soon be coming up from below. To me, that noise always sounded as though the headmaster was firing a pistol at the ceiling of his study. Looking back on it now, there seems little doubt that the matron dislikes small boys very much indeed. She never smiled at us or said anything nice, and when, for example, the lint stuck to the cut of your kneecap, you were not allowed to take it off yourself bit by bit so that it didn't hurt. She would always whip it off with a flourish, muttering, "'Don't be such a ridiculous little baby!' On one occasion, during my first term, I went down to the matron's room to have some iodine put on a grey's knee, and I didn't know you had to knock before you entered. I opened the door and walked right in, and there she was in the centre of the sick room floor, locked in some kind of an embrace with the Latin master, Mr. Victor Corrado. They flew apart as I entered, and both their faces went suddenly crimson. "'How dare you come in without knocking?' the matron shouted. "'Here I am, trying to get something out of Mr. Corrado's eye, "'and in you burst and disturbed the whole delicate operation. "'I'm very sorry, matron. "'Go away and come back in five minutes,' she cried, "'and I shot out of the room like a bullet. <laughs> "'After lights out, the matron would prowl the corridor like a panther, "'trying to catch the sound of a whisper behind a dormitory door.' and we soon learnt that her powers of hearing were so phenomenal that it was safer to keep quiet. Once, after lights out, a brave boy called Rag tiptoed out of our dormitory and sprinkled castor, or, castor sugar all over the linoleum floor of the corridor. When Rag returned and told us that the corridor had been successfully sugared from one end to the other, I began shivering with excitement. I lay there in the dark in my bed, waiting and waiting for the matron to go on the prowl, Nothing happened. Perhaps, I told myself, she is in her room taking another speck of dust out of Mr. Victor Corrado's eye. Suddenly, far down the corridor came a resounding crunch. Crunch, crunch, crunch went the footsteps. It sounded as though a giant was walking on loose gravel. Then we heard the high-pitched, furious voice of the matron in the distance. Who did this? she was shrieking. How dare you do this? She went crunching along the corridor, flinging open all the dormitory doors and switching on all the lights. The intensity of her fury was frightening. Come along, she cried out, marching with crunching steps up and down the corridor. Own up! I want the name of the filthy little boy who put down the sugar. Own up immediately. Step forward. Confess. Don't own up, we whispered to Rag. We won't give you away. Rag kept quiet. Rag kept quiet. I didn't blame him for that. Had he owned up, it was certain his fate would have been a terrible and bloody one. Soon the headmaster was summoned from below. The matron, with steam coming out of her nostrils, cried out to him for help, and now the whole school was herded into the long corridor, where we stood, freezing in our pyjamas and bare feet, while the culprit or culprits were ordered to step forward. Nobody stepped forward. I could see that the headmaster was getting very angry indeed. His evening had been interrupted. Red splotches were appealing all over his face and flecks of spit were shooting out of his mouth as he talked. Very well, he thundered. Every one of you will go at once and get the key to his tuck box. Hand the keys to Matron, who will keep them for the rest of the term, and all parcels coming from home will be confiscated from now on. I will not tolerate this kind of behaviour. We handed in our keys, and throughout the remaining six weeks of the term, we went very hungry. But all through those six weeks, Arkel continued to feed his frog with slugs through the hole in the lid of his tuck box, 
using an old teapot he also poured water in through the hole every day to keep the creature moist and happy. I admired Arkel very much for looking after his frog so well. Although he himself was famished, he refused to let his frog go hungry. Ever since then I have tried to be kind to small animals. Each dormitory had about twenty beds in it. There were smallish, narrow beds ranged along the walls on either side. Down the centre of the dormitory stood the basins where you washed your hands and face and did your teeth, always with cold water, which stood in large jugs on the floor. Once you had entered the dormitory, you were not allowed to leave it unless you were reporting to the matron's room with some sickness or injury. Under each bed there was a white chamber pot, and before getting into bed you were expected to kneel on the floor and empty your bladder into it. All around the dormitory, just before lights out, was heard the little tinkle-tinkle of little boys peeing into their pots. Once you had done this and got into your bed, you were not allowed to get out of it again until next morning. There was, I believe, a lavatory somewhere along the corridor, but only an attack of acute diarrhoea would be accepted as an excuse for visiting it. A journey to the upstairs lavatory automatically classed you as a diarrhoea victim, and a dose of thick white liquid would immediately be, f be forced down your throat by the matron. This made you constipated for a week. The first miserable homesick night at St. Peter's, when I curled up in bed and the lights were put out, I could think of nothing but our house at home and my mother and my sisters. Where were they, I asked myself, in which direction from where I was lying was Landaff. I began to work it out, and it wasn't difficult to do this, because I had the Bristol Channel to help me. If I looked out of the dormitory window, I could see the channel itself, and the big city of Cardiff with Landaff alongside it lay almost directly across the water, but slightly to the north. Therefore, if I turned towards the window, I would be facing home. I wriggled round in my bed and faced my home and my family. From then on, during all the time I was at St. Peter's, I never went to sleep with my back to my family. Different beds in different dormitories required the working out of new directions, but the Bristol Channel was always my guide, and I was always able to draw an imaginary line from my bed to our house over in Wales. Never once did I go to sleep looking away from my family. It was a great comfort to do this. There was a boy in our dormitory during my first term called Tweedy, who one night started snoring soon after he had gone to sleep. "'Who's that talking?' cried the matron, bursting in. "'My own bed was close to the door, "'and I remember looking up at her from my pillow "'and seeing her standing there, silhouetted against the light from the corridor, "'and thinking how truly frightening she looked. "'I think it was her enormous bosom that scared me most of all. "'Her eyes were riveted to it, "'and to me it was like a battering ram "'or, or the bows of an icebreaker, "'or maybe a couple of high-explosive bombs. "'Own up!' She cried, who's talking? We lay there in science. Then Tweedy, who was lying fast asleep on his back, with his mouth open, gave another snore. The matron stared at Tweedy. Snoring is a disgusting habit, she said. Only the lower classes do it. We shall have to teach him a lesson. She didn't switch on the light, but she advanced into the room and, picking up a cake of soap from the nearest basin, the bare electric bulb in the corridor illuminated the whole dormitory in a pale, creamy glow. None of us dared to sit up in bed, but all eyes were on the matron now, watching to see what she was going to do next. She always had a pair of scissors hanging by a white tape from her waist, and with this she began shaving thin slivers of soap into the palm of one hand. Then she went over to where the wretched Tweedy lay, and very carefully she dropped these little soap flakes into his open mouth. She had a whole handful of them, and I thought she was never going to stop. What on earth was going to happen? I wondered. Would Tweedy choke? Would he strangle? Might his throat get blocked up completely? Was she going to kill him? The matron stepped back a couple of paces and folded her arms, or rather, underneath her massive chest. Nothing happened. Tweedy kept right on snoring. Then suddenly he began to gurgle, and white bubbles appeared around his lips. The bubbles grew and grew until in the end his whole face seemed to be smothered in a bubbly, foaming, white, soapy froth. It was a horrific sight. Then all at once Tweedy gave a great cough and a splutter, 
and he sat up very fast and began clawing at his face with his hands. Oh, he stuttered. Oh, 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 oh no. What's happening? And what's on my face? Somebody help me. The matron threw him a face flannel and said, Wipe it off, Tweedy, and don't ever let me hear you snoring again. Hasn't anyone ever taught you not to go to sleep on your back? And with that, she marched out of the dormitory and slammed the door. <laughs> yeah, that's it. A di different time, wasn't it? Dark fur in the 1920s, eh? 100 years ago. Very different. Homesickness. I was homesick during the whole of my first term at St. Peter's. Homesick is, homesickness is a bit like seasickness. You don't know how awful it is until you get it, and when you do, it hits you right in the top of the stomach and you want to die. The only comfort is that both homesickness and seasicknesses, seasickness are instantly curable. The first goes away the moment you walk out of the school grounds, and the second is forgotten as soon as the ship enters port. I was so devastatingly homesick during my first two weeks that I set about devising a stunt for getting myself sent back home, even if it were only for a few days. My idea was that I should all of a sudden develop an attack of acute appendicitis. You will probably think it, it is silly that a nine-year-old boy should imagine he could get away with a little trick like that, but I had sound reasons for trying it on. Only about a month before, my ancient half-sister, who was twelve years older than me, had actually had appendicitis, and for several days before her operation I was able to observe her behaviour at close quarters. I noticed that the thing she complained about most was a severe pain down in the lower right side of her tummy. As well as this, she kept being sick and refused to eat and ran a temperature. You might, by the way, be interested to know that this sister had her appendix removed, not in a fine hospital operating room full of brown lights and gown nurses, but on our own nursery table at home by the local doctor and, uh, and his anaesthetic. Oh, sorry, and his anaesthetist. In those days, it was fairly common practice for a doctor to arrive at your own house with a bag of instruments, then drape a sterile sheet over the most convenient table and get on with it. On this occasion, I can remember lurking in the corridor outside the nursery while the operation was going on. My other sisters were with me, and we stood there spellbound, listening to the soft medical murmurs coming from behind the locked door and picturing the patient with her stomach sliced open like a lump of beef. We could even smell the sickly fumes of ether filtering through the crack under the door. Now that's not something that happens nowadays, is it? Uh, you know, doctor coming to the house and cutting open the children. Mm -mm. The next day we were allowed to inspect the appendix itself in a glass bottle. It was a longish, black, wormy looking thing and I said, Do I have one of those inside me, Nanny? Everybody has one, Nanny answered. What's it for? I asked her. God works in mysterious ways, she said, which was her stock reply whenever she didn't know the answer. What makes it go bad? I asked her. Toothbrush bristles, she answered, this time with no hesitation at all. Toothbrush bristles, I cried. How can toothbrush bristles make your appendix go bad? Nanny, who nanny, who in my eyes was filled with more wisdom than Solomon, replied, Whenever a bristle comes out of your toothbrush and you swallow it, it sticks in your appendix and turns it rotten. In the war, she went on, the German spies used to sneak box loads box loads of loose bristles toothbrushes into our shops and millions of our soldiers got appendicitis. Honestly, Nanny, I cried, is that honestly true? 
I never lie to you, child, she answered, so let that be a lesson to you, never to use an old toothbrush. For years after that, I used to get nervous whenever I found a toothbrush bristle on my tongue. As I went upstairs and knocked on the brown door after breakfast, I didn't even feel frightened of the matron. Come in, boomed the voice. I entered the room, clutching my stomach on the right-hand side and staggering pathetically. What's the matter with you? the matron shouted, and the sheer force of her voice that caused that massive bosom to quiver like a gigantic blamange. Don't know if you've ever seen blamange spelled out, but it's spelled out blank monge, blamange. It, it hurts, matron, I moaned. Oh, it hurts so much, just here. You've been overeating, she barked. What do you expect if you guzzle currant cake all day long? I haven't eaten a thing for days, I lied. I couldn't eat, matron, I simply couldn't. Get on the bed and lower your trousers, she ordered. I lay on the bed and she began prodding my tummy violently with her fingers. I was watching her carefully and when she hit what I guessed was the appendix place, I let out a yelp that rattled the window panes. Ow! 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 I cried. Don't, matron, don't! Then I slipped in the clincher. I've been sick all morning, I moaned, and now there's nothing left to be sick with, but I still feel sick. This was the right move. I saw her hesitate. Stay where you are, she said, and she walked quickly from the room. She may have been a foul and beastly woman, but she had had a nurse's training, and she didn't want a ruptured appendix on her hands. Within an hour, the doctor arrived, and he went through the same prodding and poking, and I did my yelping and what I thought were the proper times. Then he put a thermometer in my mouth. Hmm, he said. It reads normal. Let me fill your stomach once more. Ouch! I screamed when he touched the vital spot. The doctor went away with the matron. The matron returned half an hour later and said, The headmaster has telephoned your mother and she's coming to fetch you this afternoon. I didn't answer her. I just lay there trying to look very ill, but my heart was singing out with all sorts of wonderful songs of praise and joy. I was taken home across the Bristol Channel on the paddle steamer, and I felt so wonderful about being away from that dreaded school building that I very, very nearly forgot I was meant to be ill. That afternoon I had a session with Dr. Dunbar at his surgery in Cathedral Road, Cardiff, and I tried the same tricks all over again. But Dr. Dunbar was far wiser and more skilful than either the matron or the school doctor. After he had prodded my stomach and I had done my yelping routine, he said to me, Now you can get dressed again and seat yourself on that chair. He himself sat down behind his desk and fixed me with a penetrating but not unkindly eye. You're faking, aren't you? he said. How do you know? I blurted out. "'Because your stomach is soft and perfectly normal,' he answered. "'If you had had any inflammation down there, the stomach would have been quite hard and rigid. "'It's quite easy to tell.' "'I kept silent. "'I expect you're homesick,' he said. "'I nodded miserably. "'Everyone is at first, he said. "'You have to stick it out. "'And don't blame your mother for sending you away to boarding school. "'She insisted you were too young to go, "'but it was I who persuaded her it was the right thing to do. "'Life is tough.' and the sooner you learn how to cope with it, the better for you. What will you tell the school? I asked him, trembling. I'll say you had a very severe infection of the stomach, which I am curing with pills, he answered, smiling. It will mean that you must stay home for three more days, but promise me you won't try anything like this again. Your mother has enough on her hands without having to rush over to fetch you out of school. I promise, I said. I'll never do it again. <laughs> A drive in the motor car. Somehow or other, I got through the first term at St. Peter's, and towards the end of December, my mother came over on the paddle boat to take me and my trunk home for the Christmas holidays. Oh, the bliss and the wonder of being with the family once again after all those weeks of fierce discipline. Unless you have been to boarding school when you are very young, it is absolutely impossible to appreciate the delights of living at home. It is almost worth going away because it's so lovely coming back. I could hardly believe that I didn't have to 
wash in cold water in the mornings or keep silent in the corridors or say sir to every grown-up man I met or use a chamber pot in the bedroom or get flicked with wet towels while naked in the changing room or eat porridge for breakfast that seem full of little round lumpy grey sheep's droppings or walk all day long in perpetual fear of the young long yellow cane that lay on top of the corner cupboard in the headmaster's study. The weather was exceptionally mild that Christmas holiday, and one amazing morning our whole family got ready to go for our first drive in the first motor car we had ever owned. This new motor car was an enormous long black French automobile called a D. Dion Bouton, which had a canvas roof that folded back. The driver was to be that twelve years older than me half-sister, now aged twenty-one, who had recently had her appendix removed. She had received two full half-hour lessons in driving from the man who delivered the car, and in that enlightened year of 1925 this was considered quite sufficient. Nobody had to take a driving test. You are your own judge of competence, and as soon as you felt you were ready to go, off you jolly well went. <laughs> as we all climbed into the car, our excitement was so intense we could hardly bear it. How fast will it go, we cried out. Will it do fifty miles an hour? It'll do sixty, the ancient sister answered. Her tone was so confident and cocky it should have scared us to death, but it didn't. Oh, let's make it do sixty, we shouted. Will you promise to take us up to sixty? <coughs> We shall probably go faster than that, the sister announced, pulling on her driving gloves and tying a scarf over her head in the approved driving fashion of the period. The canvas hood had been folded back because of the mild weather, converting the car into a magnificent open tourer. Up front there were three bodies in all, the driver behind the wheel, my half-brother, aged 18, and one of my sisters, aged 12. In the back seat there were four more of us, my mother, aged forty, two small sisters, aged eight and five, and myself, aged nine. Our machine possessed one very special feature which I don't think you see on the cars today. This was a second windscreen in the back, solely to keep the breeze off the faces of the back seat passengers when the hood was down. It had a long centre section and two little end sections that could be angled backwards to deflect the wind. We were all quivering with fear and joy as the driver let out the clutch and the great long black automobile leaned forward and stole into motion. "'Are you sure you know how to do it?' we shouted. "'Do you know where the brakes are?' "'Be quiet!' snapped the ancient sister. "'I've got to concentrate.' Down the drive we went and out into the village of Landaff itself. Fortunately, there were very few vehicles on the roads in those days. Occasionally you met a small truck or a delivery van and now and again a private car but the danger of colliding with anything else was fairly remote as long as you kept the car on the road. The splendid black tourer kept, crept slowly through the village with the driver pressing the rubber bulb of the horn every time we passed the human being whether it was the butcher boy on his bicycle or just the pedestrian strolling on the pavement. Soon we were entering a countryside of green fields and high hedges with not a soul in sight. "'You didn't think I could do it, did you?' cried the ancient sister, turning round and grinning at us all. "'Now you keep your eyes on the road,' my mother said nervously. "'Go faster,' we shouted. "'Go on, make her go faster. Put your foot down. We're only doing fifteen miles an hour.' <laughs> Spurred on by our shouts and taunts, the ancient sister began to increase the speed. The engine roared and the body vibrated. The driver was clutching the steering wheel as though it were the hair of a drowning man. And we all watched the speedometer needle creeping up to twenty, then twenty-five, then thirty. We were probably doing about thirty-five miles an hour when we came suddenly to a sharpish bend in the road. The ancient sister, never having been faced with a situation like this before, shouted help and slammed on the brakes and swung the wheel vividly round. The rear wheels locked and went into a fierce sideways skid, and then with a marvellous crunch of mud guards and metal, we went crashing into the hedge. The front passengers all shot through the front windscreen, and the back passengers all shot through the back windscreen. Glass, there was no triplex then, flew in all directions, and so did we. 
My brother and one sister landed on the bonnet of the car. Someone else was catapulted out on the road, and at least one small sister landed in the middle of the hawthorn hedge. But miraculously, nobody was hurt very much except me. My nose had been cut almost clean off my face as I went through the rear windscreen, and now it was hanging on by a single small thread of skin. My mother disentangled herself from the scrimmage and grabbed the handkerchief from her purse. She clapped the dangling nose back onto, back into place fast and held it there. Not a cottage or a person was in sight, let alone a telephone. Some kind of bird started twittering in a tree farther down the road. Otherwise, it was all silent. My mother was bending over me in the rear seat and saying, Lean back and keep your head still. To the ancient sister, she said, Can you get this thing going again? The sister pressed the starter, and to everyone's surprise, the engine fired. Back it out of the hedge, my mother said, and hurry. The sister had trouble finding reverse gear. The cogs were grinding against one another with a fearful noise of tearing metal. I've never actually driven it backwards, she admitted at last. Everyone, with the exception of the driver, my mother and me, was out of the car and standing on the road. The noise of gear wheels grinding against each other was terrible. It sounded as though a lawnmower was being driven hard over hard rocks. The ancient sister was using bad words and going crimson in the face. Excuse me. But then my brother leaned his head over the driver's door and said, Don't you have to put your foot on the clutch? The harassed driver depressed the clutch pedal and the gears meshed and one second later the great black beast leapt backwards out of the hedge and careered across the road and into the hedge on the other side. Try to keep cool, my mother said. Go forward slowly. <laughs> At last the shattered motor car was driven out of the second hedge and stood sideways across the road, blocking the highway. A man with a horse and cart now appeared on the scene, and the man dismounted from his cart and walked across to our car and leaned over the rear door. He had a big drooping moustache and wore a small black bowler hat. "'You're in a fair old mess here, aren't you?' he said to my mother. "'Can you drive a motor car?' my mother asked him. "'Nope,' he said, "'and you're blocking up the old road. "'I've got a thousand fresh-laid eggs in this cart, and I want to get them to market before noon.' Get out of the way, my mother told him. Can't you see there's a child in here who's badly injured? One thousand fresh laid eggs, the man repeated, staring straight at my mother's hand and the blood-soaked handkerchief and the blood running down her wrist. And if I don't get them to market by noon today, I won't be able to sell them till next week. Then they won't be fresh laid any more, will they? I'll be stuck with one thousand stale old eggs that nobody wants. <laughs> I hope they all go rotten, my mother said. Now back that cart out of our way this instant. And to the children standing on the road, she cried out, Jump back into the car, we're going to the doctor. There's glass all over the seats, they shouted. Never mind the glass, my mother said. We've got to get this boy to the doctor fast. The passengers crawled back into the car. The man with the horse and cart backed off to a safe distance. The ancient sister managed to straighten the vehicle and get it pointed in the right direction, and then at last the once magnificent automobile tottered down the highway and headed for Dr. Dunbar's surgery in Cathedral Road, Cardiff. I've never driven in a city, the ancient and trembling sister announced. You're about to do so, my mother said. Keep going. Proceeding at no more than four miles an hour all the way, we finally made it to Dr. Dunbar's house. I was hustled out of the car and in through the front door with my mother, still holding the blood-stained handkerchief. Firmly over my wobbling nose, good heavens, cried Dr. Dunbar, it's been cut clean off. It hurts, I moaned. He can't go around with a, without a nose for the rest of his life, the doctor said to my mother. It looks as though he may have to, my mother said. Nonsense, the doctor told her. I shall sew it on again. Can you do that, my mother asked him. I can try, he answered. I shall tape it on tight for now and I'll be up at your house with my assistant within the hour. Huge strips of sticking plaster were strapped across my face to hold the nose in position. Then I was led back into the car and we crawled the two miles home to Landaff.
About half an hour later I found myself lying upon that same nursery table my ancient sister had occupied some months before for her appendix operation. Strong hands held me down while a mask stuffed with cotton wool was clamped down over my face. I saw a hand above me holding a bottle with white liquid in it and the liquid was being poured onto the cotton wool inside of the mask. Once again I smelled the sickly stench of chloroform and ether and a voice was saying, breathe deeply, take some nice deep breaths. I fought fiercely to get off that table but my shoulders were pinned down by the full weight of a large man. The hand that was holding the bottle above my face kept tilting it farther and farther forward and the white liquid dripped and dripped onto the cotton wool. Blood-red circles began to appear before my eyes and the circles started to spin round and round until they made a scarlet whirlpool with deep black hole in the centre and miles away in the distance a voice was saying, That's a good boy. We're nearly there now. We're nearly there. Just close your eyes and go to sleep. I woke up in my own bed with my anxious mother sitting beside me holding my hand. I didn't think you were ever going to come round, she said. You've been asleep for more than eight hours. Did Dr Dunbar sew my nose on again, I asked her. Yes, she did. Will it stay on? He says it will. How do you feel, my darling? Sick, I said. After I had vomited into a small basin, I felt a little better. Look under your pillow, my mother said, smiling. I turned and lifted a corner of my pillow, and underneath it, on the snow-white sheet, there lay a beautiful golden sovereign with the head of King George V on its uppermost side. That's for being brave, my mother said. You did very well. I'm proud of you. I think I have one of them. A golden sovereign. <clears throat> We've got some um, comments. Dark fur, yes. Um. <laughs> yes, seat belts were important at some point. <clears throat> Captain Hardcastle. We called them masters in those days, not teachers, and at St. Peter's the one I feared most of all, apart from the headmaster, was Captain Hardcastle. This man was slim and wiry and he played football. On the football field he wore white running shorts and white gym shoes and short white socks. His legs were as hard and thin as ram's legs and the skin round his calves was almost exactly the colour of mutton fat. The hair on his head was not ginger. It was brilliant dark vermilion, like a ripe orange, and it was plastered back with immense quantities of, brilli of brilliantine in the same fashion as the headmaster's. The parting in his hair was a white line straight down the middle of the scalp, so straight it could have been made with a ruler. On either side of the parting you could see the comb tracks running back through the greasy orange hair like little tram lines. <laughs> Captain Hardcastle sported a moustache that was the same colour as his hair and oh what a moustache it was a truly terrifying sight a thick orange hedge that sprouted and flourished between his nose and his upper lip and ran clear across his face from the middle of one cheek to the middle of the other but this was not one of those nail brush moustaches all short and clipped and bristly nor was it a long and droopy in the walrus style. Instead, it was curled most splendidly upwards, all the way along as though it had a permanent wave put into it, or possibly curling tongs, heated in the morning over a tiny flame of methylated spirits. The only other way he could have achieved this curling effect, we boys decided, was by prolonged upward brushing with a hard toothbrush in front of the looking-glass every morning. Behind the moustache there lived an inflamed and savaged face with a deeply corrugated brow that indicated a very limited intelligence. Life is a puzzlement, the corrugated brow seemed to be saying, and the world is a dangerous place, 
All men are enemies and small boys are insects that will turn and bite you if you don't get them first and squash them hard. Captain Hardcastle was never still. His orange head twitched and jerked perpetually from side to side in the most alarming fashion, and each twitch was accomplished by a little grunt that came out of the nostrils. He had been a soldier in the army in the Great War, and that, of course, was how he had received his title. But even small insects like us knew that Captain was not a very exalted rank, and only a man with little else to boast about would hang on to it in civilian life. It was bad enough to keep calling yourself Major after it was all over, but Captain was the bottoms. Rumour had it that the constant twitching and jerking and snorting was caused by something called shell shock, but we were not quite sure what that was. We took it to mean that an explosive object had gone off very close to him, with such an enormous bang that it had made him jump high in the air, and he hadn't stopped jumping since. And uh, this was, um, you know, shell shock back in the 19, uh, after the the First World War, you know, they, they didn't know, um, they didn't know anything about it, now it's peed. PTSD, isn't it? And uh, it can be intense even without having a bomb go off. And here we've got another reference. Um, Rondino String says, Captain Hardcastle was very similar to the master in Danny Champion of the World. And I, and I think you're right there. The um, Yeah, I think it's definitely based on him. So, um, yeah, good one there. For a reason that I could never properly understand, Captain Hardcastle had it in for me from my very first days at St. Peter's. I think he might even be called Captain Hardcastle or something similar. Perhaps it was because he taught Latin and I was no good at it. Perhaps it was because already at the age of nine I was very nearly as tall as he was. Or even more likely it was because I took an instant di dislike to his giant orange moustache and he often caught me staring at it with what was probably a little sneer under my nose. I had only to pass within ten feet of him in the corridor and he would glare at me and shout, Hold yourself straight, boy. Pull your shoulders back or take those hands out of your pockets or what's so funny, may I ask? What are you smirking at? Or most insulting of all, you. What's your name? Get on with your work. I knew, therefore, that it was only a matter of time before the gallant captain nailed me good and proper. The crunch came during my second term when I was exactly nine and a half and it happened during evening prep. Every weekday evening the whole school would sit for one hour in the main hall between six and seven o'clock and do prep. The master on duty for the week would be in charge of prep, which meant that he sat high up on the dais at the top end of the hall and kept order. Some masters read a book while taking prep and some corrected exercises, but not Captain Hardcastle. He would sit up there on the dais, twitching and grunting, and never once would he look down at his desk. His small, milky blue eyes would rove the hall for the full sixty minutes, searching for trouble, and heaven help the boy who caused it. The rules of prep were simple but strict. You were forbidden to look up from... Excuse me. You were forbidden to look up from your work, and you were forbidden to talk. That was all there was. <clears throat> I'll start again. Oh, Lancaster. Yep. Well done. Thanks, Rondino. Hardcastle, Lancaster. There, um, but yeah, definitely um, good one there. It's definitely based on him, isn't it? <clears throat> I'll try that bit again because there's a few coughs and uh, <laughs> splutters there. <laughs> The rules of prep were simple but strict. You were forbidden to look up from your work and you were forbidden to talk. That was all there was to it. But it left you precious, precious little leeway. In extreme circumstances, and I never knew what these were, you could put your hand up and wait until you were asked to speak. But you had better be awfully sure that the circumstances were extreme. 
Only twice during my four years at St. Peter's did I see a boy putting up his hand during prep. The first one went like this. Master, what is it? Please, sir, may, but may I be excused to go to the lavatory? Certainly not. You should have gone before. But, sir, please, sir, I didn't want to go before. I didn't know. Whose fault was that? Get on with your work. But, sir, oh, sir, please, sir, let me go. One more word out of you and you'll be in trouble. Naturally, the wretched boy dirtied his pants, which caused a storm later on upstairs with the matron. Wow. <laughs> On the second occasion, I remember clearly that it was a summer term and the boy who put up his hand was called Braithwaite. I also seem to recollect that the master taking prep was our friend Captain Hardcastle, but I wouldn't swear to it. The dialogue went something like this. The master. Yes, what is it? Please, sir, a wasp came in through the window and it stung me on my lip and it's swelling up. A what? A wasp, sir. Speak up, boy, I can't hear you. A what came in through the window? It's hard to speak up, sir, with my lips swelling up. With your what all swelling up? Are you trying to be funny? No, sir, I promise I'm not, sir. Talk properly, boy. What's the matter with you? I've told you, sir. I've been stung, sir. My lip is swelling. It's hurting terribly. Hurting terribly? What's hurting terribly? My lip, sir. It's getting bigger and bigger. What prep are you doing tonight? French verbs, sir. We have to write them out. Do you write with your lip? No, sir, I don't, sir. But, you see, all I see is that you're making an infernal noise and disturbing everybody in the room. Now get on with your work. They were, though, though, they were, though, those masters, make no mistake about it, and if you wanted to survive, you had to become pretty tough yourself. My own turn came, as I said, during my second term and Captain Hardcastle was again taking prep. You should know that during prep every boy in the hall sat at his own small individual wooden desk. These desks had the usual sloping wooden tops with a narrow flat strip at the far end where there was a groove to hold your pen and a small hole in the right hand side in which the inkwell sat. The pens we used had detachable nibs and it was necessary to dip your nib in the inkwell every six or seven seconds when you were writing. Ballpoint pens and felt pens had not then been invented and fountain pens were forbidden. The nibs we used were very fragile and most boys kept a supply of new ones in a small box in their trouser pockets. Prep was in progress. Captain Hardcastle was sitting up on the dais in front of us, stroking his orange moustache, twitching his head and grunting through his nose. His eyes roved the hall endlessly, searching for mischief. The only noises to be heard were Captain Hardcastle's little snorting grunts and the soft sound of pen nibs moving over paper. Occasionally there was a ping as somebody dipped his nib too violently into his tiny white porcelain inkwell. Disaster struck when I foolishly stubbed the tip of my nib into the top of the desk. The nib broke. I knew I hadn't got a spare one in my pocket, but a broken nib was never accepted as an excuse for not finishing prep. We had been set an essay to write, and the subject was The Life Story of a Penny. I still have that essay in my files. I had made a decent start, and I was rattling along fine when I broke that nib. There was still another half hour of prep to go, and I couldn't sit there doing nothing all that time. Nor could I put up my hand and tell Captain Hardcastle I had broken my nib. I simply did not dare. And as a matter of fact, I really wanted to finish that essay. I knew exactly what was going to happen to my penny through the next two pages, and I couldn't bear to leave it unsaid. I glanced to my right. The boy next to me was called Dobson. He was the same age as me, nine and a half, and a nice fellow. Even now, sixty years later, I can still remember that Dobson's father was a doctor, and that he lived, as I had learnt from the label on Dobson's tuck box, at the Red House, Uxbridge, Middlesex. Dobson's desk was almost touching mine. I thought I would risk it. I kept my head lowered, but watched Captain Hardcastle very carefully. When I was fairly sure he was looking the other way, I put a hand in front of my mouth and whispered, Dobson, Dobson, could you lend me a nib?
Suddenly there was an explosion up at the dais. Captain Hardcastle had leapt to his feet and was pointing at me and shouting, You're talking! I saw you talking! Don't try to deny it! I distinctly saw you talking behind your hand! I sat there frozen with terror. Every boy stopped working and looked up. Captain Hardcastle's face had gone from red to deep purple and he was twitching violently. Do you deny you were talking? he shouted. No, sir, no, but, but. And do you deny you were trying to cheat? Do you deny you were asking Dobson for help with your work? No, sir, I wasn't. I wasn't cheating. Of course you were cheating. Why else, may I ask, would you be speaking to Dobson? I take it you were not inquiring after his health? It is worth reminding the reader once again of my age. I was not a self-possessed lad of fourteen, nor was I twelve or even ten years old. I was nine and a half, and at that age one is ill-equipped to tackle a grown-up man with flaming orange hair and a violent temper. One can do little but one can do little else but stutter. I I've broken my nib, sir, I whispered. I I was asking Dobson if he could could, could lend me one, sir. You are lying cried Captain Hardcastle, and there was triumph in his voice. I always knew you were a liar and a cheat as well. All I w wanted was a nib, sir. I'd shut up if I were you, thundered the voice in the dice. You'll only get yourself into deeper trouble. I'm giving you a stripe. These were words of doom. A stripe. I'm giving you a stripe. All round I could feel a kind of... Th Sympathy reaching out to me from every boy in the school, and nobody moved or made a sound. Here I must explain the system of stars and stripes that we had at St. Peter's. For exceptionally good work, you could be awarded a quarter star, and a red dot was made with crayon beside your name on the notice board. If you got four quarter stars, a red line was drawn through the four dots, indicating that you had completed your star. For exceptionally poor work or bad behaviour, you were given a stripe, and that automatically meant a thrashing from the headmaster. Every master had a book of quarter stars and a book of stripes, and these had to be filled in and signed and torn out, exactly like cheques from a chequebook. The quarter stars were pink, the stripes were a fiendish blue-green colour. The boy who received a star or a stripe would pocket it until the following morning after prayers when the headmaster would call upon anyone who had been given one or the other to come forward in front of the whole school and hand it in. Stripes were considered so dreadful that they were not given very often. In any one week it was unusual for more than two or three boys to receive stripes. And now Captain Hardcastle was giving one to me. Come here, he ordered. I got up from my desk and walked to the dais. He already had his book of stripes on the desk and was filling out one out. He was using red ink, and along the line where it said reason, he wrote, talking in prep, trying to cheat and lying. He signed it and tore it out of the book. Then, taking plenty of time, he filled in the counterfoil. He picked up the terrible piece of green-blue paper and waved it in my direction, but he didn't look up. I took it out of his hands and walked back to my desk. The eyes of the whole school followed my progress. For the remainder of prep I sat at my desk and did nothing. Having no nib, I was unable to write another word about the life story of a penny. But I was made to finish it the next afternoon, instead of playing games. The following morning, as soon as prayers were over, the headmaster called for quarter stars and stripes. I was the only boy to go up. The assistant masters were sitting on very upright chairs on either side of the headmaster, and I caught a glimpse of Captain Hardcastle, arms folded across his chest, head twitching, the milky blue eyes watching me intently, the look of triumph still glimmering on his face. I handed in my stripe. The headmaster took it and read the writing. Come and see me in my study, he said, as soon as this is over. Five minutes later, walking on my toes and trembling terribly, I passed through the green baize door and entered the sacred precincts where the headmaster lived. I knocked on his study door. Enter. I turned the knob and went in to this large square room with bookshelves and easy chairs and the, and the gigantic desk topped with red leather straddling in the far corner. The headmaster was sitting behind the desk, holding my stripe in his fingers. What have you got to say for yourself? he asked me.
What have you got to say for yourself? He asked me, and the white shark's teeth flashed dangerously between his lips. I didn't lie, sir, I said. I promise I didn't, and I wasn't trying to cheat. Captain Hardcastle says you are doing both, the headmaster said. Are you calling Captain Hardcastle a liar? No, sir. Oh, no, sir. I wouldn't if I were you. I had broken my nib, sir, and I was asking Dobson if he had, if he could lend me another. That is not what Captain Hardcastle says. He says you are asking for help with your essay. <coughs> Oh, no, sir, I wasn't. I was a long way away from Captain Haas Castle, and I was only whispering. I don't think he could have heard what I said. So you are calling him a liar? Oh, no, no, sir, no, sir. I would never do that. It was impossible for me to win against the headmaster. What I would like to have said was, Yes, sir, if you really want to know, sir, I am calling Captain Hardcastle a liar, because that's what he is. But it was out of the question. I did, however, have one trump card left to play. Or I thought I did. You could ask Dobson, sir, I whispered. Ask Dobson, he cried. Why should I ask Dobson? He could tell you what I said, sir. Captain Hardcastle is an officer and a gentleman, the headmaster said. He has told me what happened. I hardly think I want to go round asking some silly little boy if Captain Hardcastle is speaking the truth. I kept silent. For talking in prep, the headmaster went on, for trying to cheat and for lying, I am going to give you six strokes of the cane. He rose from his desk and crossed over to the corner cupboard on the opposite side of the study. He reached up and took from the top of it three very thin yellow canes, each with the bent-over handle at one end. For a few seconds he held them in his hands, examining them with some care. Then he selected one and replaced the other two, on top of the cupboard. Bend over the cane again. I was frightened of that cane. There is no small boy in the world who wouldn't be. It wasn't simply an instrument for beating you. It was a weapon for wounding. It lacerated the skin. It caused severe black and scarlet bruising that took three weeks to disappear. And all the time during those three weeks you could feel your heart beating along the wounds. I tried once more, my voice slightly hysterical now. I didn't do it, sir. I swear I'm telling the truth. Be quiet and bend over, over there and touch your toes. Very slowly I bent over. Then I shut my eyes and braced myself for the first stroke. Crack! It was like a rifle shot. With a very hard stroke of the cane on one's buttocks, the time lag before you feel any pain is about four seconds. Thus, the experienced caner will always pause between strokes to allow the agony to reach its peak. So for a few seconds after the first crack, I felt virtually nothing. Then suddenly came the frightful, searing, agonising, unbearable burning across the buttocks, and as it reached its highest and most excruciating point, the second crack came down. I clutched hold of my ankles as tight as I could, and I bit into my lower lip. I was determined not to make a sound, for that would only give the execution a great satisfaction. Crack! Five seconds pause. Crack! Another pause. Crack! And another pause. I was counting the strokes, and as the sixth one hit me, I knew I was going to survive in silence. That will do, the voice behind me said. I straightened up and clutched my backside as hard as I possibly could with both hands. This is always the instinctive and automatic reaction. The pain is so frightful you try to grab hold of it and tear it away, and the tighter you squeeze the more it helps. I did not look at the headmaster as I hopped across the thick red carpet towards the door. The door was closed and nobody was about to open it for me, so for a couple of seconds I had to let go of my bottom with one hand to turn the doorknob. Then I was out and hopping again, around in the hallway of the private sanctum. Directly across the hall from the headmaster's study was the assistant master's common room. They were all in there now, waiting to spread out to their respective classrooms. But what I couldn't help noticing, even in my agony, was that this door was open. Why was it open? Had it been left that way on purpose so that they could all hear more clearly the sound of the cane from across the hall? Of course it had, and I felt quite sure that it was Captain Hardcastle who had opened it. I pictured him standing in there among his colleagues, snorting with satisfaction at every stinging stroke. 
Small boys can be very comradely when a member of their community has got into trouble, and even more so when they feel an injustice has been done. When I returned to the classroom, I, I was surrounded on all sides by sympathetic faces and voices, but one particular incident has always stayed with me. A boy of my own age, called Highton, was so violently incensed by the whole affair that he said to me before lunch that day, You don't have a father. I do. I'm going to write to my father and tell him what has happened and he'll do something about it. He couldn't do anything, I said. Oh, yes, he could, Highton said. And what's more, he will. My father won't let them get away with this. Where is he now? He's in Greece, Highton said, in Athens. But that won't make any difference. Then and there, little Highton sat down and wrote to the father he admired so much. But of course, nothing came of it. It was, nevertheless, a touching and generous gesture from one small boy to another. And I have never forgot it. Little Ellis and the Boyle During my third term at St Peter's I got flu and was put to bed in the sick room where the dreaded matron reigned supreme. In the next bed to mine was a seven-year-old boy called Ellis, whom I liked a lot. Ellis was there because he had an immense and angry-looking boil on the inside of his thigh. I saw it. It was as big as a plum and about the same colour. One morning, in came the doctor to examine us, and sailing along beside him was the matron. Her mountainous bosom was enclosed in a starched white envelope, and because of this she somehow reminded me of a painting I had once seen of a four-masted schooner in full canvas running before the wind. "'What's his temperature today?' the doctor asked, pointing at me. "'Just over a hundred, doctor,' the matron told him. "'He's been up here long enough,' the doctor said. "'Send him back to school tomorrow.' Then he turned to Ellis. "'Take off your pyjama trousers,' he said. He was a very small doctor with steel-rimmed spectacles and a bald head. He frightened the life out of me. Ellis removed his pyjama trousers. The doctor bent forward and looked at the boil. <coughs> Hmm, he said, that's a nasty one, isn't it? We're going to have to do something about that, aren't we, Ellis? What are you going to do? Ellis asked, trembling. Nothing for you to worry about, the doctor said. Just lie back and take no notice of me. Little Ellis lay back with his head on the pillow. The doctor had put his bag on the floor and at the end of Ellis's bed, and now he knelt down on the floor and opened the bag. Ellis, even when he lifted his head from the pillow, couldn't see what the doctor was doing there. He was hidden by the end of the bed, but I saw everything. I saw him take out a sort of scalpel, which had a long steel handle and a small pointed blade. He crouched below the end of Ellis's bed, holding the scalpel in his right hand. "'Give me a large towel, matron,' he said. The matron handed him a towel. Still crouching low and hidden from little Ellis's view by the end of the bed, the doctor unfolded the towel and spread it over the palm of his left hand. In his right hand, he held the scalpel. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yes, it's very sad, yes. But again, a, a different time, I think, isn't it, guys? A completely different time, different point in history. So, yeah, unless you're there, you, you don't know. But it doesn't sound like much fun, that's for sure. Ellis was frightened and suspicious. He started raising himself up on his elbows to get a better look. Lie down, Ellis, the doctor said. And even as he spoke, he bounced up from the end of the bed like a jack-in-the-box and flung the outspread towel right into Ellis's face. Almost in the same second, he thrust his right arm forward and plunged the point of the scalpel deep into the centre of the enormous boil. Whoa. He gave the blade a quick twist and then withdrew it again before the wretched boy had time to disentangle his head from the towel. Ellis screamed. He never saw the scalpel going in and he never saw it coming out, but he felt it all right and he screamed like a stuck pig. 
I can see him now struggling to get the towel off his head, and when he emerged the tears were streaming down his cheeks, and his huge brown eyes were staring at the doctor with a look of utter and total outrage. Don't make such a fuss about nothing, the matron said. Put a dressing on it, matron, the doctor said, with plenty of magsulf paste, and he marched out of the room. I couldn't really blame the doctor. I thought he handled things rather cleverly. Pain was something we were expected to endure. Anaesthetics and pain-killing injections were not much used in those days. Dentists in particular never bothered with them. But I doubt very much if you would be entirely happy today if a doctor threw a towel in your face and jumped on you with a knife. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Becky. Everyone's got their stories, haven't they, of uh, nightmare teachers and doctors. Goat's Tobacco When I was about nine, the ancient half-sister got engaged to be married. The man of her choice was a young English doctor, and that summer he came with us to Norway. Romance was floating in... Oh yeah, this is a, re a really good part of the story, uh, if you haven't heard it. Romance was floating in the air like moon dust, and the two lovers, for some reason we younger ones could never understand, did not seem to be very keen on us tagging along with them. They went out in the boat alone, they climbed the rocks alone, they even had breakfast alone. We resented this, as a family we had always done everything together, and we didn't see why the ancient half-sister should suddenly decide to do things differently, even if she had become engaged. We were inclined to blame the male lover for disrupting the calm of our family life, and it was inevitable that we would have to suffer, that he would have to suffer for it sooner or later. The male lover was a great pipe smoker. The disgusting, smelly pipe was never out of his mouth, except when he was eating or swimming. We even began to wonder whether he removed it when he was kissing his betrothed. He gripped the stem of the pipe in the most manly fashion between his strong white teeth and kept it there while talking to you. This annoyed us. Surely it was more polite to take it out and speak properly. One day we all went in our little motorboat to an island we had never been to before, and for once the ancient half-sister and the manly lover decided to come with us. We chose this particular island because we saw some goats on it. They were climbing about on the rocks, and we thought it would be fun to go and visit them. But when we landed, we found that the goats were totally wild and we couldn't get near them. So we gave up trying to make friends with them and simply sat around on the smooth rocks in our bathing costumes, enjoying the lovely sun. The manly lover was filling his pipe. I happened to be watching him as he very carefully <coughs> packed the tobacco into the bowl from a yellow oilskin pouch. He had just finished doing this and was about to light it up when the ancient half-sister called on him to come swimming. So he put down the pipe and off he went. <laughs> yeah. I stared at the pipe that was lying there on the rocks. About twelve inches away from it I saw a little heap of dried goat droppings, each one small and round like a pale brown berry, and at that point an interesting idea began to sprout in my mind. I picked up the pipe and knocked all the tobacco out of it. I then took the goat droppings and teased them with my fingers until they were nicely shredded. Very gently I poured these shredded droppings into the bowl of the pipe, packing them down with my thumb, just as the manly lover always did it. When that was done, I placed a thin layer of real tobacco over the top. The entire family was watching me as I did this. Nobody said a word, but I could sense a glow of approval all round. I replaced the pipe on the rock, and all of us sat back to await the return of the victim. The whole lot of us were in this together now, even my mother. <laughs> the mum was even there watching. I had drawn them into the plot simply by letting them see what I was doing. It was a silent, rather dangerous family conspiracy. Back came the manly lover, dripping wet from the sea, chest out, strong and virile, healthy and sunburnt. Great swim, he announced to the world. Splendid water, terrific stuff. He towered himself vigorously, making the muscles of his biceps ripple. Then he sat down on the rocks and reached for his pipe. 
Yes, MG Power. Yes, indeed. Nine pairs of eyes watched him intently. Nobody giggled to give the game away. We were trembling with anticipation, and a good deal of suspense was caused by the fact that none of us knew what was going to happen. The manly lover put the pipe between his strong white teeth and struck a match. He held the flame over the bowl and sucked. The tobacco ignited and glowed, and the lover's head was enveloped in clouds of blue smoke. Ah, he said, blowing smoke through his nostrils, there's nothing like a good pipe after a bracing swim. Still we waited. We could hardly bear the suspense. The sister, who was seven, couldn't bear it at all. What sort of tobacco do you put in that thing? She asked with superb innocence. Navy cut, the, na the male lover answered. Player's navy cut. It's the best there is. These Norwegians use all sort of disgusting scented tobaccos, but I wouldn't touch them. I didn't know they had different tastes, the small sister went on. Of course they do, the manly lover said. All tobaccos are different to the discriminating pipe smoker. Navy cut is clean and unadulterated. It's a man smoke. The man seemed to be going out of his way to use long words like discriminating and unadulterated. We hadn't the foggiest, the foggiest what they meant. The ancient half-sister, fresh from her swim, and now clothed in a towel bathrobe, came and sat close to her manly lover. Then the two of them started giving each other those silly little glances and soppy smiles that made us all feel sick. They were far too occupied with one another to notice the awful tension that had settled over our group. They didn't even notice that every face in the crowd was turned towards them. They had sunk once again into their lovers' world where the little children did not exist. <laughs> The sea was calm, the sun was shining, and it was a beautiful day. Then, all of a sudden, the manly lover let out a piercing scream, and his whole body shot about four feet into the air. His pipe flew out of his mouth and went clattering over the rocks, and the second scream he gave was so shrill and loud that all the seagulls on the island rose up in alarm. His features were twisted like those of a person undergoing severe torture, and his skin had turned the colour of snow. He began spluttering and choking and spewing and hawking and acting generally like a man with some serious internal injury. He was completely speechless. <laughs> yeah, manly lover. Don't call him by his name. Yeah, I think you're right, guys. And he, and he got his comeuppance, didn't he? And, and it reminds me, that reaction there, that paragraph I just read, it's like um, George's nan, grandma in George's Marvelous Medicine, isn't it? You know, that that vision of, you know, the smoke and the scream and the screech and the jump. It's, uh, yeah, I feel a bit of George's Marvelous Medicine there. We stared at him enthralled. The ancient half-sister, who must have thought she was about to lose her future husband forever, was pawing at him and thumping him on the back and crying, Darling, darling, what's happening to you? Where does it hurt? Get the boat, start the engine, we must rush him to hospital quickly. She seemed to have forgotten that there wasn't a hospital within fifty miles. I've been poisoned, spluttered the manly lover. It's got into my lungs, it's in my chest, my chest is on fire, my stomach's going up in flames. Help me get into the boat quick, cried the ancient half-sister, gripping him under the armpits. Don't just sit there staring, come and help. No, 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 cried the now not-so-manly lover. Leave me alone, I need air, give me air. He lay back and breathed deep draughts of splendid Norwegian ocean air, and in another minute or so he was sitting up again and was on the way to recovery. What in the world came over you? asked the ancient half-sister, clasping his hands tenderly in hers. I can't imagine, he murmured. I simply can't imagine. His face was still and white as virgin snow, and his hands were trembling. There must be a reason for it, he added. There's got to be a reason. I know the reason, shouted the seven-year-old sister, screaming with laughter. I know what it was. What was it? snapped the ancient one. What have you been up to? Tell me at once. It's his pipe, shouted the small sister, still convulsed with laughter. What's wrong with my pipe? said the manly lover. 
You've been smoking goat's tobacco, cried the small sister. It took a few moments for the full meaning of these words to dawn upon the two lovers, but when it did, and when the terrible anger began to show itself on the manly lover's face, and when he started to rise slowly and menacingly to his feet, we all sprang up and ran for our lives and jumped off the rocks into the deep water. <laughs> Fantastic, eh? Karma, it all comes round. Um, genius dude, yes, Becky. Um, I think he definitely got his, uh, he got his comeuppance. And uh, yeah, forgive me, guys. Uh, nature calls once again, I think, because I've, I've gone once. I've, uh, yeah, anyway, we don't need to talk too much about that. But I'll be back in one minute once again. <laughs> Sorry, get, get yourselves another tea or another drink if you uh, can. And then we're on to the last section. Um, Repton and Shell so the senior school and then his first job so I'll be back in one minute <laughs> Hello there, I'm back and just laughing at uh, people's uh, breaks. <laughs> it, it is a long read, Lumpy Horse. We've still got a fair bit to go as well, so it will be a long one. Dark Fur's taking a chocolate break and a Lumpy Horse having tea. And caramel popcorn. Send some my way, please. That sounds pretty tasty. Caramel popcorn. But anyway, back to the read and the last section. Repton and Shell, 1929 to 1936, age 13 to 20. So I think, yeah, this is sort of the senior school. Um, and then his first job. Um, I'm glad you're enjoying it, uh, MG Power. It's really good, isn't it? It's um, a really special, these two books, Boy and Going Solo. Like I say, um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably read Going Solo next week, but they're, they're really special autobiographies, I think, um, because of how well Roald Dahl writes. But anyway. <clears throat> Getting Dressed for the Big School. When I was 12, my mother said to me, I've entered you for Marlborough and Repton. Which would you like to go to? Both were famous public schools, but that was all I knew about them. Repton, I said, I'll go to Repton. It was an easier word to say than Marlborough. Very well, my mother said, you shall go to Repton. We were living in Kent then, in a place called Bexley. Repton was up in the Midlands, near Derby, and some 140 miles away to the north. This was of no consequence. There were plenty of trains. Nobody was taken to school by car in those days. We were put on the train. I was exactly 13 in September 1929 when the time came for me to go to Repton. On the day of my departure, I had first of all to get dressed for the part. I had been to London with my mother the week before to buy the school clothes and I remember 
how shocked I was when I saw the outfit I was expected to wear. I can't possibly go about in those, I cried. Nobody wears things like that. Are you sure you haven't made a mistake, my mother said to the shop assistant. If he's going to Repton, madam, he must wear these clothes, the assistant said firmly. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly could be worse. There's worse things to be addicted to, dark fur, so yeah. <laughs> he, if he's going to Repton, madam, he must wear these clothes, the assistant said firmly. And now this amazing fancy dress was all laid out on my bed waiting to be put on. Put it on, my mother said. Hurry up or you'll miss the train. I'll look like a complete idiot, I said. My mother went out of the room and left me with it, left me to it with immense reluctance. I began to dress myself. First, there was a white shirt with a detachable white collar. This collar was unlike any collar I had seen. It was as stiff as a piece of perspex. At the front, the stiff points of the collar were bent over to make a pair of wings, and the whole thing was so tall that the points of the wings, as I discovered later, rubbed against my underneath of my chin. It was known as a butterfly collar. To attach the butterfly collar to the shirt, you needed a back stud and a front stud. I had never been through this rigmarole before. I must do this properly, I told myself. So first I put the back stud into the back of the collar band and the shirt. Then I tried to attach the back of the collar to the back stud, but the collar was so stiff I couldn't get the stud through the slit. I decided to soften it with spit. I put the edge of the collar into my mouth and sucked the starch away. It worked. The stud went through the slit and the back of the collar was now attached to the back of the shirt. I inserted the front stud, one side of the front of the shirt, and slipped the shirt over my head. With the help of a mirror, I now set about pushing the top of the front stud through the first of the two slits in the front of the collar. It wouldn't go. The slit was so small and stiff and starchy that nothing would go through it. I took the shirt off and put both of the front slits of the collar into my mouth and chewed them until they were soft. The starch didn't taste of anything. I put the shirt back on again and, at last, I was able to get the front stud through the collar slits. Uh, yeah, I'm too young to remember, but obviously I'm aware that in the old days the, the collars and the shirts were separate, as Dahl's trying to explain to us uh, not very exciting. Even Roald Dahl can't make it put in the collar on a shirt exciting, although he's trying his best, isn't he? Um, <clears throat> Around the collar, but underneath the butterfly wings, I tied a black tie using an ordinary tie knot. Then came the trousers and the braces. The trousers were black with thin pinstriped grey lines running down them. I buttoned the braces onto the trousers, six buttons in all. Then I put on the trousers and adjusted the braces to correct the length by sliding two brass clips up and down. I put on a brand new pair of black shoes and laced them up. Now for the waistcoat. This was also black and it had twelve buttons down the front and two little waistcoat pockets on either side, one above the other. I put it on and did up the buttons, st starting at the top and working down. I was glad I didn't have to chew each of those buttonholes to get the buttons through them. All this was bad enough for a boy who had never before worn anything more elaborate than a pair of shorts and a blazer. But the jacket put the lid on it. It wasn't actually a jacket. It was a sort of tailcoat. And it was without a doubt the most ridiculous garment I had ever seen. Rigmarole, yeah? <laughs> and there's... um. Young Dahl with his silly hat and tailcoat and, uh... <laughs> well, I hope it, it's, it, it, I hope it evokes some nice memories, uh, Becky, rigmarole. Uh, so, yeah, that's Roald Dahl getting ready for Repton. Like the waistcoat, it was jet black and made of a heavy serge-like material. In the front, it was cut away so that the two sides met only at one point about halfway down the waistcoat. Here there was a single button and this had to be done up. 
From the button downwards, the line of the coat separated and curved away behind the legs of the wearer and came together again at the backs of the knees, forming a pair of tails. These tails were separated by a slit, and when you walked about, they flapped against your legs. I put the thing on and did up the front button. Feeling like an undertaker's apprentice in a funeral parlour, I crept downstairs. Yeah, well, I'm not sure it is me, me, you, you, but we'll find out, won't we? This is what we're going to get into now, but, um, yeah, you'll find out. <laughs> My sisters shrieked with laughter when I appeared. He can't go out in those, they cried. He'll be arrested by the police. Put your hat on, my mother said, handing me a stiff, wide-brimmed hat, straw hat with a blue and black band around it. I put it on and did my best to look dignified. The sisters fell all over the room laughing. My mother got me out of the house before I lost my nerve completely, and together we walked through the village to Bexley Station. My mother was going to accompany me to London and see me on onto the Derby train, but she had been told that on no account should she travel farther than that. I had only a small suitcase to carry. My trunk had been sent on ahead labelled luggage in advance. Nobody's taking the slight, slightest notice of you, my mother said as we walked through Bexley High Street, and curiously enough, nobody was. I have learnt one thing about England, my mother went on. It is a country where men love to wear uniforms and eccentric clothes. Two hundred years ago, their clothes were even more eccentric than they are today. You can consider yourself lucky you don't have to wear a wig on your head and ruffles on your sleeves. I still feel an ass, I said. Everyone who looks at you, my mother said, knows that you are going away to a public school. All English public schools have their own different crazy uniforms. People will be thinking how lucky you are to be going to one of those famous places. We took the train from Beth Bexley to Charing Cross and then went by taxi to Euston Station. At Euston I was put on the train for Derby with a lot of other schoolboys who all wore the same ridiculous clothes as me and away I went. I think um, Boaz's, the next chapter. I think it's Boaz's, not Boaz's. I'm going to go for Boaz's. At Repton, prefects were never called prefects. They were called Boaz's. Doesn't sound right, but Boaz's we're going for. And they had the power of life and death over us junior boys. So, yeah, this is what we're going to ex experience now that it's not only the matron and the masters and the teachers, now the older boys are involved, so strap in. At Repton, prefects were never called prefects, they were called Boazes, and they had the power of life and death over us junior boys. They could summon us down in our pyjamas at night time and thrash us for leaving just one football sock on the floor of the changing room when it should have been hung up on a peg. A Boazer could thrash us for a hundred and one other piddling little misdemeanours, for burning his toast at tea time, for failing to dust his study properly, for failing to get his study fire burning in spite of spending half your pocket money on fire lighters, for being late at roll call, for talking in evening prep, for forgetting to change into house shoes at six o'clock. The list was endless. Four with the dressing gown or three with it off the Boaza would say to you in the changing room late at night. Others in the dormitory had told you what to, what to answer to this question. Four with it on, you mumbled, trembling. This Boaza was famous for the speed of his strokes. Most of them paused between each stroke to prolong the operation. But Williamson, the great footballer, cricketer and athlete, always delivered his strokes in a series of swift back-and-forth movements without any pause between them at all. Four strokes would rain down upon your bottom so fast that it was all over in four seconds. A ritual took place in the dormitory after each beating. The victim was required to stand in the middle of the room and lower his pyjama trousers so that the damage could be inspected. 
Half a dozen experts would crowd round you and express their opinions in highly professional language. What a super job! He's got every single one in the same place. Crikey! Nobody could tell you had had more than one except for the mess. Boy, that Williamson's got a terrific eye. Of course he's got a terrific eye. Why do you think he's a cricket teamer? There's no wet blood, though. If you had had just one more, he'd have got some blood out. Through a dressing ground, too. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Most Boazes couldn't get a result like that without a dressing ground. You must have tremendously thin skin. Even Williamson couldn't have done that to ordinary skin. Do you use the long one or the short one? Hang on, don't pull them up yet. I've got to see this again. And I would stand there, slightly bemused by this cool, clinical approach. Once I was still standing in the middle of the dormitory with my pyjama trousers around my knees when Williamson came through the door. What on earth do you think you're doing, he said, knowing very well exactly what I was doing. N -n nothing, I stammered, N -n nothing at all. Pull those pyjamas up and get into bed immediately, he ordered, but I noticed that as he turned away to go out of the door, he craned his head ever so slightly to one side to catch a glimpse of my bare bottom and his own handiwork. I was certain I detected a little glimmer of pride around the edges of his mouth before he closed the door behind him. <laughs> no, no, uh... yeah, it's, good, it's good language, isn't it, Becky? And yes, I'm afraid um, dark fur, it's not better. Hey, look at this. Chandra Green, goodness me, and it's nearly my birthday, 40 minutes away, so thank you Chandra, what a generous uh, super chat, yeah, wow, thank you, and just to comment on that chapter, uh, Repton, now we've got senior boys, so um, I think Roald Dahl at this stage is 13 and I imagine the Boazes, the prefects are sort of 16 and 17 so in that last scene you've got a, an older boy caning the younger boy and then the younger boy going back to the room and everyone wants to see his bottom and see the the stripes is uh, yeah all very strange back in those days but Chandra thank you so much and welcome to the stream it's lovely to see you and yeah, thanks again. The Headmaster The Headmaster, while I was at Repton, struck me as being a rather shoddy, bandy-legged little fellow with a big bald head and lots of energy, but not much charm. Mind you, I never did know him well, because in all those months and years I was at school, I doubt whether he addressed me more than six sentences to me. I doubt whether he addressed more than six sentences to me altogether, so perhaps it was wrong of me to form a judgment like that. What is so interesting about this headmaster is that he became a famous person later on. At the end of my third year, he was suddenly appointed Bishop of Chester, and off he went to live in a palace by the River Dee. I remember at the time trying to puzzle out how on earth a person could suddenly leap from being a schoolmaster to becoming a bishop all in one jump, but there were bigger puzzles to come. From Chester he was soon promoted again to become Bishop of London, and from there, after not all that many years, he bounced up the ladder once more to get the job the, to get the top job of them all, Archbishop of Canterbury. And not long after that, he was, it was he himself who had the task of crowning our present Queen in Westminster Abbey with half the world watching him on television. Well, well, well. And this was the man who used to deliver the most vicious beatings to the boys under his care. By now, I'm sure you will be wondering why I lay so much emphasis upon school beatings in these pages. The answer is, is that I cannot help it. All through my school life I was appalled by the fact that masters and senior boys were allowed literally to wound other boys and sometimes quite severely. I couldn't get over it. I never have got over it. It would, of course, be unfair to suggest that all masters were constantly beating the daylights out of all the boys in those days. They weren't. 
Only a few did so, but that was quite enough to leave a lasting impression of horror upon me. It left another more physical impression upon me as well, even today whenever I have to sit for any length of time on a hard bench or chair, I begin to feel my heart beating along those lines that the cane made on my bottom some fifty years ago. There is nothing wrong with a few quick, sharp tickles on the rump. They probably do a naughty boy a lot of good. But this headmaster we were talking about wasn't just tickling you when he took out his cane to deliver a flogging. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Dark First. A slice of history and... Um, yeah, he he was beating the boys up and then became the Archbishop of Canterbury. Crazy. He never flogged me, thank goodness, but I was given a vivid description of one of these ceremonies by my best friend at Repton, whose name was Michael. Michael was ordered to take down his trousers and kneel on the headmaster's sofa with the top half of his body hanging over one end of the sofa. The great man then gave him one terrific crack. After that there was a pause. The cane was put down and the headmaster began filling his pipe from a tin of tobacco. He also started to lecture the kneeling boy about sin and wrongdoing. Soon the cane was picked up again and a second tremendous crack was administered upon the trembling buttocks. Then the pipe filling business and the lecture went on for maybe another thirty seconds. Then came the third crack of the cane. Then the instrument of torture was put once more upon the table and a box of matches was produced. A match was struck and applied to the pipe. The pipe failed to light properly. A fourth stroke was delivered with the lecture continuing. This slow and fearsome process went on until ten terrible strokes had been delivered and all the time over the pipe lighting and the match striking the lecture on evil and wrongdoing and sinning and misdeeds and malpractice went on without a stop. It even went on as the strokes were being administered. At the end of it all, a basin, a sponge and a small clean towel were produced by the headmaster and the victim was told to wash away the blood before pulling up his trousers. Do you wonder then that this man's behaviour used to puzzle me tremendously? He was an ordinary clergyman at that time, as well as being a headmaster, and I would sit in the dim light of the school chapel and listen to him preaching about the Lamb of God and about mercy and forgiveness and all the rest of it, and my young mind would become totally confused. I knew very well that only the night before this preacher had shown neither forgiveness nor mercy in flogging some small boy who had broken the rules. So what was it all about, I used to ask myself. Did they preach one thing and practice another, these men of God? And if someone had told me at the time this flogging clergyman was one day to become the Archbishop of Canterbury, I would never have believed it. It was all this, I think, that made me begin to have doubts about religion and even about God. If this person, I kept telling myself, was one of God's chosen salesmen on earth, then there must be something very wrong about the whole business. And you... um. You hear a lot of these stories, don't you? Anyone who went to a school, uh, a religious school, a religious boarding school or a school where there was nuns. I, I never experienced it myself, but supposedly, yeah, certain nuns were um, yeah, really terrible. So I think that's why a lot of people are, are put off religion, especially Catholics and Christians, because, you know, how do you... Um, uh, what word does he say? Um, how, do, how do you overcome this disparity, right? They're preaching one thing and practicing something else, but we don't need to get distracted with all that. But It's very sad, isn't it? <clears throat> and that sounds like a serious flogging. Next chapter. Chocolates. Every now and then, a plain grey cardboard box was dished out to each boy in our house, and this, believe it or not, was a present from the great chocolate manufacturer's Cadbury. Inside the box there were twelve bars of chocolate, all of different shapes, all with different fillings, and all with numbers from one to twelve stamped on the chocolate underneath. 
Eleven of these bars were new inventions from the factory. The twelfth was the control bar, one that we all knew well, usually a Cadbury's coffee cream bar. Also in the box was a sheet of paper, with the numbers 1 to 12 on it, as well as two blank columns, one for giving marks to each chocolate from 0 to 10, and the other for comments. All we were required to do in return for this splendid gift was to taste very carefully each bar of chocolate, give it marks, and make an intelligent comment on why we liked it or disliked it. It was a clever stunt. Cadbury's were using some of the greatest chocolate bar experts in the world to test out their new inventions. We were of a sensible age, between 13 and 18, and we knew intimately every chocolate bar in existence, from the milk flake to the lemon marshmallow. Quite obviously, our opinions on anything new would be valuable. All of us entered into this game with great gusto, sitting in our studies and nibbling each bar with the air of connoisseurs, giving our marks and making our comments. Too subtle for the common palate was one that I remember writing down. <laughs> for me, the importance of all this was that I began to realise that the large chocolate companies actually did possess inventing rooms, and they took their inventing very seriously. I used to picture a long white room like a laboratory. Oh, sorry, we, we got some comments here. Um, oh, Leanne's, Leanne's going... Um, Thanks, Leanne. I appreciate that. And, um, yeah, have a good day. Take care. And I hope you enjoy the ending. We've, yeah, we're, we're, we're coming to the final. Still a few pages to go, but we're coming to the end. <clears throat> and obviously, this, no doubt, is uh, informs Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, right, when he would taste the uh, Cadbury's new chocolate. Funny, isn't it, how uh, it all makes sense, right, when you when you learn about his, his upbringing. I used to picture a long white room like a laboratory with pots of chocolate and fudge and all sorts of other delicious fillings bubbling away on the stoves while men and women in white coats moved between the bubbling pots, tasting and mixing and concocting their wonderful new inventions. I used to imagine myself working in one of these labs and suddenly I would come up with something so absolutely unbearably delicious that I would grab it in my hand and go rushing out of the lab and along the corridor and right into the office of the great Mr. Cabri himself. I've got it, sir, I would shout, putting the chocolate in front of him. It's fantastic. It's fabulous. It's marvellous. It's irresistible. Slowly the great man would pick up my newly invented chocolate and he would take a small bite. He would roll it round in his mouth. Then all at once he would leap from his chair crying, You've got it. You've done it. It's a miracle. He would slap me on the back and shout, We'll sell it by the million. We'll sweep the world with this one. How on earth did you do it? Your salary is doubled. It was lovely dreaming those dreams and I have no doubt at all that 35 years later when I was looking for a plot for my second book for children, I remembered those little cardboard boxes and the newly invented chocolates inside them, and I began to write a book called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So there we go. Corkers. There were about 30 or more masters at Repton, and most of them were amazingly dull and totally colourless and completely uninterested in the boys. But Corkers, an eccentric old bachelor, was neither dull nor colourless. Corkers was a charmer, a vast, ungainly man with drooping bloodhound cheeks and filthy clothes. He wore creaseless flannel trousers and a brown tweed jacket with patches all over it and bits of dried food on the lapels. He was meant to teach us mathematics, but in truth he taught us nothing at all, and that was the way he meant it to be. His lessons consisted of an endless series of distractions, all invented by him so that the subject of mathematics would never have to be discussed. He would come lumbering into the classroom and sit down at his desk and glare at the class. He would wait expectantly, wondering what was coming next. Let's have a look at the crossword puzzle in today's times, he would say, fishing a crumpled newspaper out of his jacket pocket. That'll be a lot more fun than fiddling around with figures. I hate figures. 
figures are probably the dreariest thing on this earth. <clears throat> then why do you teach mathematics, sir? Somebody would ask him. I don't, he said slyly. I only pretend to teach it. Corkers would proceed to draw the framework of the crossword on the blackboard and we would all spend the rest of the lesson trying to solve it while he read out the clues. We enjoyed that. The only time I can remember him vaguely touching upon mathematics was when he whisked the square of tissue paper out of his pocket and waved it around. Look at this, he said. This tissue paper is one hundredth of an inch thick. I fold it once, making it double. I fold it again, making it four thicknesses. Now then, I will give it a large I will give a large bar of Cadbury's fruit and nut milk chocolate to any boy who can tell me to the nearest twelve inches how thick it will be if I fold it fifty times. <clears throat> we all stuck up our hands and started guessing. Twenty four inches, sir, three feet, sir, five yards, sir, three inches, sir. You're not very clever, are you? Corkus said. The answer is the distance from the earth to the sun. That's how thick it would be. We were enthralled by this piece of intelligence and asked him to prove it on the blackboard, which he did. Another time he brought a two-foot-long grass snake into class and insisted every boy should handle it in order to cure us forever, as he said, of fear of snakes. This caused quite a commotion. I cannot remember all the other thousands of splendid things that old Corkers cooked up to keep his class happy, but there was one that I shall never forget, which was repeated at intervals about, of about three weeks throughout each term. He would be talking to us about this or that, when suddenly he would stop in mid-sentence, and a look of intense pain would cloud his ancient countenance. Then his head would come up, and his great nose would begin to sniff the air, and he would cry aloud, by God, this is too much, this is going too far, this is intolerable. We knew exactly what was coming next, but we always played along with him. What's the matter, sir? What's happened? Are you all right, sir? Are you feeling ill? Up went the great nose once again, and the head would move slowly from side to side, and the nose would sniff the air delicately, as though searching for a leak of gas or the smell of something burning. This is not to be tolerated, he would cry. This is unbearable. But what's the matter, sir? I'll tell you what's the matter, Corkers would shout. Somebody's farted. <laughs> oh, no, sir, not me, sir, nor me, sir. It's none of us, sir. At this point, he would rise majestically to his feet and call out at the top of his voice, Use door as fans. Open all windows. This was the signal for frantic activity and everyone in the class would leap to his feet. It was a well-rehearsed operation, and each of us knew exactly what he had to do. Four boys would man the door and begin swinging it back and forth at great speed. The rest would start clambering about on the gigantic windows with, which occupied one whole wall of the room, flinging the lower ones open, using a long pole with a hook at the end to open the top ones, and leaning out to gulp the fresh air in, in mock distress. While this was going on, Corkers himself would march serenely out of the room, muttering, It's the cabbage that does it. All they give you is disgusting cabbage and Brussels sprouts, and you go off like firecrackers. And that was the last we saw of Corkers for the day. Fagging is the next chapter, so we're going to learn about fagging, some more um, friendly, friendly, kind, lovable activities maybe. I spent two long years as a fag at Repton, or maybe not because he was a fag. I spent two young, long years as a fag at Repton, which meant I was the servant of the study holder in whose study I had my little desk. If the study holder happened to be a house Boaza, so much the worse for me, because Boazas were a dangerous breed. During my second turn, I was unfortunate enough to be put into the study of the head of the house, a supercilious and obnoxious seventeen-year-old 
called Carlton. Carlton always looked at you right down the length of his nose, and even if you were as tall as him, which I happened to be, he would tilt his head back and still manage to look at you down the length of his nose. Carlton had three fags in his study, and all of us were terrified of him, especially on Sunday mornings, because Sunday was study cleaning time. All the fags in all the studies had to take off their jackets, roll up their sleeves, fetch buckets and floor cloths, and get down to cleaning out the study holder's study. And when I say cleaning out, I mean practically sterilising the place. We scrubbed the floor and washed the windows and polished the grate and dusted the ledges and wiped the picture frames and carefully tidied away the hockey sticks and cricket bats and umbrellas. All that Sunday morning we had been slogging away cleaning Carlton's study and then, just before lunch, Carlton himself strode into the room and said, You've had long enough. <clears throat> yes, Carlton, the three of us murmured, trembling. We stood back, breathless from our exertions, compelled, as always, to wait and watch the dreadful Carlton while he performed the ritual of inspection. First of all, he would go to the drawer of his desk and take out a pure white cotton glove, which he slid with much ceremony onto his right hand. Then, taking as much care and time as a surgeon in an operating theatre, he would move slowly round the study, running his white-gloved finger along all the ledges, along the tops of the picture frames, over the surfaces of the desks, and even over the bars of the fire grate. Every few seconds he would hold those white fingers up close to his face, searching for traces of dust, and we three fags would stand there watching him, hardly daring to breathe, waiting for the dreaded moment when the great man would stop and shout, Ha! What's this I see? A look of triumph would light up his face as he held up a white finger, which had on it the tiniest smudge of grey dust, and he would stare at us with his slightly popping pale blue eyes and say, You haven't cleaned it, have you? You haven't bothered to clean my study properly. To the, three fa to the three of us fags who had been slaving away for the whole of the morning, these words were simply not true. We've cleaned every bit of it, Carlton, we would answer, every little bit. In that case, why has my finger got dust in it? Carlton would say, tilting his head back and gazing at us down the length of his nose. This is dust, isn't it? We would step forward and peer at the white-gloved forefinger and at the tiny smidgen of dust that lay on it and we would remain silent. I longed to point out to him that it was an actual impossibility to clean a much-used room to the point where no speck of dust remained, but that would have been suicide. Do any of you dispute the fact that this is dust? Carlton would say, still holding up his finger. If I am wrong, do tell me. It isn't much dust, Carlton. I didn't ask you whether it was much dust or not much dust, Carlton would say. I simply asked you whether or not it was dust. Might it, for example, be iron filings or face powder instead? No, Carlton. Or crushed diamonds, maybe? No, Carlton. Then what is it? It's... it's dust, Carlton. Thank you, Carlton would say. At last you have admitted that you failed to clean my study properly. I shall therefore see all three of you in the changing room tonight after prayers. The rules and rituals of fagging at Repton were so complicated that I could fill a whole book with them. A house boaza, for example, could make any fag in the house do his bidding. He could stand anywhere he wanted to in the building, in the corridor, in the changing room, in the yard, and yell, FAG! at the top of his voice, and every fag in the place would have to drop what he was doing and run flat out to the source of the noise. There was always a mad stampede when the call of, Fag echoed through the house, because the last boy to arrive would invariably be chosen for whatever menial or unpleasant task the Boaza had in mind. During my first term, I was in the changing room one day just before lunch, scraping the mud from the soles of my study holder's football boots, when I heard the famous shout of Fag far away at the other end of the house. I dropped everything and ran, but I got there last, and the Bawaza who had done the shouting, a massive athlete called Wilberforce, said, Dahl, come here. The other fags melted away with the speed of light, and I crept forward to receive my orders. Go and heat my seat in the bogs, Wilberforce said. I want it warm. 
I hadn't the faintest idea what any of this meant, but I already knew better than to ask questions of a Boaza. I hurried away and found a fellow fag who told me the meaning of this curious order. It meant that the Boaza wished to use the lavatory, but that he wanted the seat warmed for him before he sat down. The six house lavatories, none with doors, were situated in an unheated outhouse, and on a cold day in winter you could get frostbite out there if you stayed too long. This particular day was icy cold, and I went out through the snow into the outhouse and entered number one lavatory, which I knew was reserved for the Boazes only. I wiped the frost from the seat with my handkerchief, then I lowered my trousers and sat down. I was there a full fifteen minutes in the freezing cold before Wilberforce entered the scene, or sorry, arrived on the scene. Have you got the ice of it? he asked. Yes, Wilberforce. Is it warm? It's as warm as I can get it, Wilberforce, I said. We shall soon find out about that, he said. You can get off now. I got off the, lav the lavatory and pulled up my trousers. Wilberforce lowered his own trousers and sat down. Very good, he said, very good indeed. He was like a wine taster sampling an old claret. I shall put you on my list, he added. I stood there doing up my fly buttons and not knowing what on earth he meant. Some fags have cold bottoms, he said, and some have hot ones. I only use hot bottom fags to heat my bog seat. I won't forget you. He didn't. From then on, all through that winter, I became Wilberforce's favourite bog seat warmer and I used always to keep a paperback book in the pocket of my tail coat to while away the long bog-warming sessions. I must have read the entire works of Dickens sitting on that Boaz's bog during my first winter at Repton. Hello there, true swords... True sausage. <laughs> I d I'm sorry, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but that's what it looks like. Um, yeah, that's definitely right, Dark Fur. How are you doing? I wanted to ask if you have any videos on Galileo or Bacon. Uh, I have never. I don't. Um, so no, sorry, no Galileo or Bacon as of yet, but maybe soon. Yeah, I remember this story of the... Um, the seat warmer before the problem pony mine too so we've got two chapters left this is the penultimate chapter two chapters left games and photography it was always a surprise to me that I was good at games it was an even greater surprise that I was exceptionally good at two of them one of these was called Fives, the others was called Squash Rackets. Fives, which many of you will know nothing about, was taken seriously at Repton, and we had a dozen massive glass-roofed Fives courts kept always in perfect condition. We played the game of Eaton Fives, which is always played by four people, two on each side, and basically it consists of hitting a small, hard, white, leather-covered ball with your gloved hands. The Americans have something like it, which they call handball, but Eaton Fives is far more complicated because the court has all manner of ledges and buttresses built into it, which help to make it a subtle and crafty game. Fives is possibly the fastest ball game on earth, far faster than squash, and the little ball ricochets around the court at such a speed that sometimes you can hardly see it. You, see a, you need a swift eye, strong wrists, and very quick pair of hands to play fives well, and it was a game I took to right from the beginning. You may find it hard to believe, but I became so good at it that I won both the junior and the senior school fives in the same year when I was fifteen. Soon I bore the splendid title Captain of Fives, and I would travel with my team to other schools like Shrewsbury and Uppingham to play matches. I loved it. It was a game without physical contact, and the quickness of the eye and the dancing of the feet were all that mattered. <laughs> a captain of any game at Repton was an important person. He was the one who selected the members of the team for matches. He, and only he, could award colours to others. 
He could award school colours by walking up to the chosen boy after a match and shaking him by the hand and saying, Graggers on you, teamer. These were magic words. They entitled the new teamer to all manner of privileges, including a different coloured hat, band, on his straw hat, and fancy braid around the edges of his blazer in different coloured games clothes, and all sorts of other advertisements that made the teamer gloriously conspicuous among his fellows. A captain of any game, whether it was football, cricket, fives or squash, had many other duties. It was he who pinned the notice on the school notice board on match days, announcing the team. It was he who arranged fixtures by letters with other school. It was he and only he who had it in his power to invite this master or that to play against him and his team on certain afternoons. All these responsibilities were given to me when I became captain of fives. Then came the snag. It was more or less taken for granted that a captain would be made a boaza in recognition of his talents. If not a school boaza, then certainly a house boaza. But the authorities did not like me. I was not to be trusted. I did not like rules. I was unpredictable. I was therefore not boaza material. There was no way they would agree to make me a house boaza, let alone a school boaza. Some people are born to wield power and exercise authority. I was not one of them. I was in full agreement with my housemaster when he explained this to me. I would have made a rotten boaza. I would have let down the whole principle of boazadom by refusing to beat the fags. I was probably the only captain of any game who has never become a boaza at Repton. I was certainly the only un double captain, because I was also captain of squash rackets, and to pile glory upon glory, I was in the school football team as well. <laughs> A boy who is good at games is usually treated with great civility by the masters at an English public school. In much the same way, the ancient Greeks revered their athletes and made statues of them in marble. Athletes were the demigods, the chosen few. They could perform glamorous feats beyond the reach of ordinary mortals. Even today, fine footballers and baseball players and runners and all other great sportsmen are much admired by the great general public and advertisers use them to sell breakfast cereals. This never happened to me, and if you really want to know, I'm awfully glad it didn't. But because I love playing games, life for me at Repton was not totally without pleasure. Games playing at school is always fun, if you happen to be good at it, and it is hell if you are not. I was one of the lucky ones, and all those afternoons on the playing fields and in the fives courts and in the squash courts made the otherwise grey and melancholy days pass a lot more quickly. There was one other thing that gave me great pleasure at this school, and that was photography. I was the only boy who practised it seriously, and it was not quite so simple as a business fifty years ago as it is today. I made myself a little dark room in a corner of the music building, and in there I loaded my glass plates and developed my negatives and enlarged them. Our arts master was a shy retiring man called Arthur Norris, who kept himself well apart from the rest of the staff. Arthur Norris and I became close friends, and during my last year he organised an exhibition of my photographs. He gave the whole of the art school over to this project, and helped me to get my enlargements framed. The exhibition was rather a success, and masters who had hardly ever spoken to me over the past four years would come up and say things like, "'It's quite extraordinary. We didn't know we had an artist in our mists. Are they for sale?' Arthur Norris would give me tea and cakes in his flat and would talk to me about painters like Cezanne and Manet and Matisse, and I have a feeling that it was there having tea with the gentle, soft-spoken Mr Norris in his flat on Sunday afternoons that my great love of painters and their work began. Hi there, K.M. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Becky. Sounds like an interesting experience there. Thanks to your brother. <laughs> Hello, KM. Welcome. 
After leaving school, I continued for a long time with photography and I became quite good at it. Today, given a 35mm camera and a built-in exposure meter, anyone can be an expert photographer. But it was not so easy 50 years ago. I used glass plates instead of film and each of these had to be loaded into a separate container in the dark room before I set out to take pictures. I usually carried with me six loaded plates which allowed me only six exposures so that clicking the shutter even once was a serious business that had to be carefully thought out beforehand. How different now, hey, with, um, with, with an iPhone. You just snap away all day long, snap, snap, snap and not have to worry. Yeah, crazy to think in the old days, the, the first cameras. <clears throat> um, you may not believe it, but when I was 18, I used to win prizes and medals from the Royal Photographic Society in London and from other places like the Photographic Society of Holland. I even got a lovely big bronze medal from the Egyptian Photographic Society of Cairo, and I still have the photograph that won, won it. It is a picture of one of the so-called Seven Wonders of the World, the Arch of Stesiphon in Iraq. This is the largest unsupported arch on earth and I took the photograph while I was training out there for the RAF in 1940. I was flying over the desert solo in an old Hawker Hart biplane and I had my camera around my neck. When I spotted the huge arch standing alone in the sea of sand, I dropped one wing and hung my straps and let go of the stick while I took aim and clicked the shutter. It came out fine. The Arch of Stesiphon. I don't know if you can see that there, but there it is. I'm sure you can Google it as well if you're uh, interested. So now we've arrived at the final chapter. And this is um, a sort of... What's the word? My brain's, uh, my brain's not working. Um, um, a transition, this final chapter is a transition from boy to going solo and hopefully we'll read going solo next week um, the alchemy of photography now lost to the horrid photoshop yes me me you you i've um i've never actually uh, got into photoshop at all but of course like everyone else has seen photoshop photos and um yes it's a, it's a whole new ball game but anyway on to the final chapter Excuse me. And before I'll say it again at the end, but I'll say it now. Um, yeah, this has been definitely by far and away the best stream so far. And um, I'm sure there's a number of reasons for that. But yeah, the main reason is because all you guys are here. So thanks for being here. Final chapter. Goodbye school. During my last year at Repton, my mother said to me, would you like to go to Oxford or Cambridge when you leave school? In those days, it was not difficult to get in either of these great universities so long as you could pay. No, thank you, I said. I want to go straight from school to work for a company that will send me to wonderful faraway places like Africa or China. You must remember that there was virtually no air travel in the early 1930s. Africa was two weeks away from England by boat, and it took you about five weeks to get to China. These were distant and magic lands, and nobody went to them just for a holiday. You went there to work. Nowadays, you can go anywhere in the world in a few hours, and nothing is fabulous anymore. But it was very different matter in 1933. And don't forget that this is 1984 he's writing this. So, um, now in 2022... And, um, yeah, of course, it's different again. So, during my last term, I applied for a job only to those companies that would be sure to send me abroad. They were the Shell Company, Eastern Staff, Imperial Chemicals, Eastern Staff, and a Finnish lumber company whose name I have forgotten. I was accepted by Imperial Chemicals and the Finnish Lumber Company, but for some reason I wanted most of all to go into the Shell Company. When the day came for me to go up to London for this interview, my housemaster told me it was ridiculous for me to even try. 
The eastern staff of Shell are the creme de la creme, he said. There will be at least 100 applicants and about five vacancies. Nobody has a hope unless he's been head of the school or head of the house, and you aren't even a house prefect. My housemaster was right about the applicants. There were 107 boys waiting to be interviewed when I arrived at the head office of the Shell Company in London, and there were seven places to be filled. Please don't ask me how I got one of those places, I don't know myself. But it I did, and when I told my housemaster the good news on my return to school, he didn't congratulate me or shake my hand, or shake me warmly by the hand. He turned away, muttering, All I can say is I'm damn glad I don't own any shares in Shell. I didn't care any longer what my housemaster thought. I was all set. I had a career. It was lovely. I was to leave school forever in July 1934 and join the Shell Company two months later in September when I would be exactly 18. I was to be an Eastern staff trainee at a salary of £5 a week. That summer, for the first time in my life, uh, oh sorry, that summer, for the first time in my life, I did not accompany the family to Norway. I somehow felt the need for a special kind of last fling before I became a businessman. So while still at school during my last term, I signed up to spend August with something called the Public Schools Exploring Society. The leader of this outfit was a man who had gone with Captain Scott on his last expedition to the South Pole, and he was taking a party of senior schoolboys to explore the interior of Newfoundland during the summer holidays. It sounded like fun. Without the slightest regret, I said goodbye to Repton forever and rode back to Kent on my motorbike. This splendid machine was a 500cc Ariel, which I had bought the year before for £18, and during my last term at Repton I kept it secretly in a garage along the Wilmington Road about two miles away. On Sundays I used to walk to the garage and disguise myself in helmet, goggles, old raincoat and rubber waders and ride all over Derbyshire. It was fun to go roaring through Repton itself with nobody knowing who you were, swishing past the masters, walking in the street and circling round the dangerous, supercilious school boazes out for their Sunday strolls. I tremble to think what would have happened to me had I been caught, but I wasn't caught. So on the last day of term I zoomed joyfully away and left school behind me for ever and ever. I was not quite eighteen. I had only two days at home before I was off to Newfoundland with the public school's explorers. Our ship sailed from Liverpool at the beginning of August and took six days to reach St John's. There were about 30 boys of my own age on the expedition as well as four experienced adult leaders. But Newfoundland, as I soon find out, was not much of a country. For three weeks we trudged all over that desolate land with enormous loads on our backs. We carried tents and ground sheets and sleeping bags and saucepans and food and axes and everything else one needs in the interior of an unmapped, uninhabitable and inhospitable country. My own load, I know, weighed exactly 114 pounds and someone else always had to help me hoist the rucksack onto my back in the mornings. We lived on pemmican and lentils, and the twelve of us who went separately on what was called the Long March from the north to the south of the island and back again suffered a good deal from lack of food. I can remember very clearly how we experimented with eating boiled lichen and reindeer moss to supplement our diet, but it was a genuine adventure, and I returned home hard and fit and ready for anything. There followed two years of intensive training with the Shell Company in England. We were seven trainees in that year's group and each one of us was being carefully prepared to uphold the majesty of the Shell Company in one or another remote tropical country. We spent weeks at the huge Shell Haven refinery with a special instructor who taught us all about fuel oil and diesel oil and gas oil and lubricating oil and kerosene and gasoline. After that, we spent months at the head office in London, learning how the great company functioned from the inside. I was still living in Bexley, Kent, with my mother and three sisters, and every morning, six days a week, 
Saturdays included, I would dress neatly in a sombre grey suit, have breakfast at 7.45, and then, with a brown trilby on my head and a furled umbrella in my hand, I would board the 8.15 train to London together with a swarm of other equally sombre-suited businessmen. I found it easy to fall into their pattern. We were all very serious and dignified gents, taking the train to our offices in the City of London, where each of us, so we thought, was engaged in high finance and other enormously important matters. Most of my companions wore hard bowler hats, and a few like me wore soft trilbies. But not one of us on that train in the year of 1934 went bareheaded. It wasn't done. And none of us, even on the sunniest days, went without his furled umbrella. The umbrella was our badge of office. We felt naked without it. Also, it was a sign of respectability. Road menders and plumbers never went to work with umbrellas. Businessmen did. <clears throat> yeah, Jill, I would say it's um yeah, it's it's an autobiography. I think this is his um yeah. His life story, his early life, and then going solo, which we read next week, is his um, later life. So, yeah, I think it's autobiography, all truth. You're very welcome, Jill. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I enjoyed it. I really did. I began to realise how simple life could be if one had a regular routine to follow with fixed hours and a fixed salary and very little original thinking to do. The life of a writer is absolute hell compelled with the life of a businessman. The writer has to force himself to work. He has to make his own hours and if he doesn't go to his desk at all, there is nobody to scold him. If he is a writer of fiction, he lives in a world of fear. Each new day demands new ideas and he can never be sure whether he is going to come up with them or not. Two hours of writing fiction leaves this particular writer absolutely drained. For those two hours he has been miles away, he has been somewhere else in a difficult place with totally different people and the effort of swimming back into normal surroundings is very great. It is almost a shock. The writer walks out of his workroom in a daze. He wants a drink, he needs it. It happens to be a fact that nearly every writer of fiction in the world drinks more whiskey than is good for him. He does it to give himself faith, hope and courage. A person is a fool to become a writer. His only compensation is absolute freedom. He has no master except his own soul and that, I'm sure, is why he does it. <laughs> the Shell Company did us proud. After twelve months at head office, we trainees were all sent to various shell branches in England to study salesmanship. I went to Somerset and spent several glorious weeks selling kerosene to old ladies in remote villages. My kerosene motor tanker had a tap at the back, and when I rolled into Shepton Malay or Midsummer Norton or Pease Down St. John or Hinton Blewett or Temple Cloud or Chew Magna or Huish Champflower, the old girls and the young maidens would hear the roar of my motor and would come out of their cottages with jugs and buckets to buy a gallon of kerosene for their lamps and their heaters. It is fun for a young man to do that sort of thing. Nobody gets a nervous breakdown or a heart attack from selling kerosene to gentle country folk from the back of a tanker in Somerset on a fine summer's day. Then suddenly, in 1936, I would summon back to head office in London. One of the directors wished to see me. We are sending you to Egypt, he said. It will be a three-year tour, then six months leave. Be ready to go in one week's time. Oh, but sir, I cried out, not Egypt. I really don't want to go to Egypt. The great man reeled back in his chair as though I had slapped him in the face with the plate of poached eggs. Egypt, he said slowly, is one of our finest and most important areas. We are doing you a favour in sending you there instead of some mosquito-ridden place in the swamps. I kept silent. May I ask why you do not wish to go to Egypt, he said. I knew perfectly well why, but I didn't know how to put it. What I wanted was jungles and lions and elephants and tall coconut palms swaying on silvery beaches, and Egypt had none of that. Egypt was a desert country. 
It was bare and sandy and full of tombs and relics and Egyptians, and I didn't fancy it at all. What is wrong with Egypt? The director asked me again. It's, 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 I stammered, it's too dusty, sir. The man stared at me. Too what? He cried. Dusty, I said. Dusty, he shouted. Too dusty? I've never heard such rubbish. There was a long silence. I was expecting him to tell me to fetch my hat and coat and leave the building forever, but he didn't do that. He was an awfully nice man, and his name was Mr. Godber. He gave a deep sigh and rubbed his hand over his eyes and said, Very well, then, if that's the way you want it. Redfern will go to Egypt instead of you, and you will have to, ne to take the next posting that comes up, dusty or not. Do you understand? Yes, sir, I realise that. If the next vacancy happens to be Siberia, he said, you'll have to take it. I quite understand, sir, I said, and thank you very much. Within a week, Mr. Godber summoned me again to his office. You're going to East Africa, he said. Hooray, I shouted, jumping up and down. That's marvellous, sir. That's wonderful. How terrific. The great man smiled. It's quite dusty there, too, he said. Lions, I cried, and elephants and giraffes and coconuts everywhere. Your boat leaves from London docks in six days, he said. You get off at Mombasa. Your salary will be five hundred pounds per annum, and your tour is for three years. I was twenty years old. I was off to East Africa, where I would walk about in khaki shorts every day and wear a topi on my head. I was ecstatic. I rushed home and told my mother, and I'll be gone for three years, I said. I was her only son, and we were very close. Most mothers, faced with a situation like this, would have shown a certain amount of distress. Three years is a long time, and Africa was far away. There would be no visits in between, but my mother did not allow even the tiniest bit of what she must have felt to disturb my joy. Oh, well done you, she cried. It's wonderful news, and it's just where you wanted to go, isn't it? The whole family came to London docks to see me off on the boat. It was a tremendous thing in those days for a young man to be going to Africa to work. The journey alone would take two weeks, sailing through the Bay of Biscay past Gibraltar, across the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea, sailing in at Aden and arriving finally at Mombasa. What a prospect that was. I was off to the land of palm trees and coconuts and coral reefs and lions and elephants and deadly snakes and a white hunter who had lived ten years in Mwanza had told me that if a black mamba bit you, you died within the hour with agony and foaming at the mouth. I couldn't wait. Although I didn't know it at the time, I was sailing away for a good deal longer than three years because the Second World War was to come along in the middle of it all. But before that happened, I got my African adventure all right. I got the roasting heat and the crocodiles and the snakes and the long safaris up country selling shell oil to the men who ran the diamond mines and the sisal plantations. I learned about an extraordinary machine called a decorticator, a name I have always loved, which shredded the big leathery sisal leaves into fibre. I learned to speak Swahili and to shake the scorpions out of my mosquito boots in the mornings. I learned what it was like to get malaria and to run a temperature of 100 degree, 105 degrees Fahrenheit for three days. And when the rainy seasons came and the water poured down in solid sheets and flooded the little dirt roads, I learned how to spend nights in the back of a stifling station wagon with all the windows closed against marauders from the jungle. Above all, I learned how to look after myself in a way that no young person can ever do, staying in civilization. When the big war broke out in 1939, I was in Dar es Salaam, and from there I went up to Nairobi to join the RAF. Six months later, I was a fighter pilot flying hurricanes all round the Mediterranean. I flew in the western desert of Libya, in Greece, in Palestine, in Syria, in Iraq, and in Egypt. I shot down some German planes and I got shot down myself, crashing in a burst of flames and crawling out and getting rescued by brave soldiers crawling on their bellies over the sand. I spent six months in hospital in Alexandria and when I came out, I flew again. But all that is another story. It has nothing to do with childhood or school or gobstoppers or dead mice or bawazes or summer holidays among the islands of Norway. It is a different tale altogether. And if all goes well, I may have a shot of telling it.
one of these days. The end. So that was Boy by Roald Dahl. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. It's a, uh, a popular favourite, isn't it? Um, so I'm sure you uh, may well have read it before and maybe even uh, several times. Um, but I think it's great. I love it. It's a brilliant book. I've read it several times. Sadly, it got taken down from my other channel, but here it is for you. And uh, yeah, like I say, next week, I think we should read Going Solo because why not? Why shouldn't we read these two biographies together or autobiographies together? And he just set it up nicely there, didn't he? He goes over to uh, Mombasa to be the Shell Company and then the war starts, World War II starts and then he heads off and joins the RAF and uh, that's what Going Solo is about, his life... Um, his uh, yeah, his life as a soldier and um, being over there. So yeah, guys, um, you're all very welcome. Um, you're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Chandra Green, Mimi, you, you, Beth, Beth Castagnoli, a lumpy horse, dark foe, dark fur E B or furry B. Well, that was a fantastic read. Thank you so much. I hope you're very welcome. Rondino, nice to see you. Becky, you're welcome. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mimi. Thank you, Becky. Uh, Chandra Green, yes, yeah, see you next week for going solo. Thanks, guys. And yes, it's uh, my birthday proper now. We've changed days. We're now on the 28th of November. Hello there, Miss Queen Jordo. We're just finishing up now, sadly, but you can go and... Uh, Watch um watch the beginning, go and watch it on replay. Lux Illumini Naughty Illuminati. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it, everyone. And so yeah, it's rather late here now, so I'm gonna go and get a few hours sleep and then uh yeah, do some more reading on my birthday. So uh, yeah, I will get some sleep. Thanks, uh, Illuminati. Google Google, you're welcome, everyone. Listen, as I said before we read the last chapter, you guys make book club what it is. I'm just here, the voice reading. Um, thank you guys. As I say, thanks for being here. Good night, everyone. Have a great week. We'll be back doing uh, more short stories, mixing up Aldous Huxley and um, Aldous Huxley and great British short stories. I have a fantastic... Um, I think it was actually you, me, me, you, you that recommended it. Um, a Christmas mystery, is it? Jostine Garda. So I have that coming up for you in December because it's uh, brilliant. So was it? It was you, me, me, you, you, wasn't it? Um, Christmas miracle or Christmas mystery, one of those two. But it's it's as a sort of Advent calendar, sh very short chapter each day of Advent. So. That's coming in December. Uh, yes, thanks, Mimi. You, you, I've got it, and it's coming. First of December will begin. So thank you for that. Thanks everyone for being here, sh sharing in this uh, wonderful live stream. Double celebration. It was all that I hoped it would be, and more. And uh, yeah, more live reads to come. Uh, I doubt. It was going to feel a bit low tomorrow and the next day. Um, but this was very special. And so, uh, yeah, guys, thanks everyone for being here and for helping celebrate not only the 5,000 subscriber mark, but my birthday. <laughs> it's a funny way to spend my birthday, but I couldn't think of anything else to do. And uh, there's nothing I'll enjoy better than doing the live reads so yeah guys thanks for making it what it is i'm going now because i'm rambling away and i'll be back tomorrow i hope so me me you you and i'll be back tomorrow yeah tomorrow evening i think a bit of aldous huxley why not and uh yeah guys have a great week i hope you can make um some of the other lives that we do and if not 
I'll see you uh, Sunday for um, going solo. Guys, thanks again. Take care and I'll see you next time. Bye, guys. See you.